And welcome to the 1.15 p.m. public portion of the closed session of the April 14th, 2020 meeting of the City Council. In this part of the meeting, the Council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the public will be closed and inaccessible. All Council members beside myself are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's City Council meeting. Please note, if you wish to comment on a closed session item, call in one of the following numbers. 1 646-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558-8656, 1-346-558
312-626-6799-1646-588-8656 or 1-253-215-8782. After calling in, you'll wanna enter the meeting number ID, which is 246 027191 and when prompted for a participant ID, please press pound. When it's time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes and you may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. If you wish to speak on another item, two things may occur. One, if the number of callers waiting exceeds capacity, will be disconnected and you will need to call back closer to when the item you wish to comment on will be heard. And second, you will be placed back in the queue and should you press star nine to raise your hand when you wish to comment on a new item. You may also send an email to cityclerk at cityofsantacruz.com. Your comments will be shared with the council members as they are received and will be entered into the public record. And with that, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Watkins? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Golder? Present. Byers? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsin tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historic trauma. And if the clerk could please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance. America and to the republic for which we stand, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. All right, the first item on our agenda is a climate action progress report presented by Tiffany Wise West, sustainability and climate action manager. Just want to check to see if Tiffany is on the call. Hello, Mayor and uh, City Council members. I'm going to share my screen with you now. And are you able to see that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Nice to see you, Tiffany. Nice to see you also. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council members. Uh, it's good to be with you today, and I hope you all are well. Um, to share with you our annual uh, Climate Action Progress Update. Um, just to remind you, hmm, I have a little trouble advancing my slides right now. Let's see. Okay. Just to remind you, the Climate Action Program um, works with the community. Uh, as well as uh, internally through our sustainability team, through our climate action task force, which is comprised of external um, members of the community and uh, various other groups to implement the climate action plan, the climate adaptation plan, as well as the health and all policies work plan. And with our health and all policies um, ordinance and, po and policies, um, we are um, setting public health, sustainability, and equity as key facets in uh, decision-making and poli uh, crafting policy and so forth. Um, for those who are new on the, on the council, um, the Climate Action Program consists of one three-quarter time um, FTE, that's me. Um, my other 25% time is spent doing flood control work. And that at any one time we may have an analyst uh, right now, we have a half-time analyst that is funded by one of our sea level rise projects. And anywhere from a couple to on up to 10 interns at one time, we currently have two. 
Um, and then, of course, we work with many other uh, key divisions within the city, which I'll mention uh, throughout the presentation. And I should say, I, I have made this abbreviated. Uh, typically, I, I go in much more depth, but under the circumstances, I've made this presentation um, somewhat abbreviated. So to orient you to the Climate Action Plan that was adopted in 2012, and it sunsets this year in 2020, we have 12 climate action milestones or goals um, that are tracked through 13 indicator metrics, each of which has a specific numeric target. And there are 254 actions that are specified to get us to those targets. So at, in this point of time, year is 2008. Um, in this point of time, we should be at 92% progress in order to be on track for all of our targets. And so I will share with you what that looks like. So we have achieved three of our targets. The first relates to our bike mode split, um, which has exceeded 10%. This is largely due to our uh, transportation division and public works, their work to get green lanes in place over the past five, six years, uh, to get the jump bikes on board, uh, online, and so forth. Um, this uh, percentage does not yet reflect the impact that the bike jumps might have on bike mode split. We also have exceeded um, the number of sustainability projects that um, we uh, had targeted uh, at 25. We are currently at 30 sustainability projects that we are collaboratively uh, undertaking and carrying out with UC Santa Cruz. Most recently, um, our Resilient Coast projects, our sea level rise projects, we are collaborating with the Coastal Science and Policy Graduate Program on elements of that, particularly around equity. Um, and uh, we have a number of others that are that are uh, ongoing, including uh, some related to public works and our resource recovery folks and helping to improve waste diversion up on campus. Um, and then finally, in terms of green businesses, we are uh, right at uh, just about at 200 businesses. And that is due to our green business program um, out of public works and their efforts to continually uh, keep green businesses certified um, keep promoting them and so forth. In terms of milestones uh, that are on track to be achieved, but we're not quite there yet, the first one is meeting 30% of our energy load with renewable energy. So that is 30% uh, of municipal energy load. Uh, right now, we are utilizing about 22% or about 21% methane that is captured and at our wastewater treatment facility and converted into electricity right there on site. And then about 8% is coming um, uh, from solar PV. And we do have three large solar installations that will be coming online later this year that are already um, in under agreement. Um, we also are on track to meet our 100% funding uh, for design or construction of the rail trail. It's kind of a unique metric. Um, and again, uh, this is uh, largely due to our public works efforts. Most recently, um, uh, segment seven of the rail trail that is uh, under construction currently, as well as the um, the uh, trestle bridge, which was a great accomplishment. We are also on track to increase our urban tree canopy by about 10%. Last year was the first year that we actually reported, were able to report on this metric. Um, we had partnered with UC Santa Cruz to complete um, an urban tree canopy uh, analysis project in GIS. Um, and this does not reflect the additional 500 trees that the Parks Department Department has planted as part of a CAL FIRE grant um, that Parks and our program are co-managing. I should mention that um, the Parks Department is also working with the consultant to finalize a report on an urban uh, tree inventory project that was just completed where they went and counted all street trees and uh, parks trees and noted their um, 
um, what state they were in, uh, whether maintenance was required, and all kinds of other metrics. So really exciting project that I expect they will report out to you on soon. In terms of milestone targets that are not on track to be achieved, I think it's important at this point to remind folks that when these targets were set um, back around 2012, there, first of all, there were not necessarily forecasting analytics that were uh, conducted in order to determine the targets, so they really were a best guess. And they were set high to reflect the ambitious um, and, or to be ambitious to reflect the environmental ethic um, of our community. However, you will note um, we still are in really great shape with respect to these. Um, in terms of solar homes, we're at about 3,200 homes. We had a really nice uptick last year. Um, the federal tax credit for solar uh, was at 30% last year. It's now reduced to 26% this year and will go to 22% next year. So um, I think we, we saw a, a bump in uh, solar homes uh, due to that uh, general generous tax credit uh, going down between last year and this year. Um, we have about 82 uh, solar uh, installations on businesses. Again, another one that is really difficult for us um, as a municipality to motivate progress on, we have streamlined um, our solar permitting process. Um, and, you know, so that's that makes it really easy. Um, and we had in the past conducted outreach to businesses and provided some grant funded technical assistance that did result in uh, three large scale installations coming online, something we'd like to replicate in the future. In terms of waste diversion, so that really is our recycling. Um, we are at 65%. We're trying to get to 75% waste diversion. Um, in terms of um, reducing single occupancy vehicle commute, commutes by uh, 10%, we're currently at 4%. This is another one that, you know, the city is, can really um, influence the built environment through our policy uh, choices that we make, but it is really difficult to influence behavior choices such as driving alone. And so um, this 4% does not reflect the recent transportation demand management program that came online um, late last year, giving bus passes to downtown employees and a number of other incentives. So we could see an uptick in this when we do our final reconciliation on 2020 a year from now. And then our, our uh, the last one that is not on track to be achieved is um, making sure that 20% of our cars are low carbon and we define low carbon as electric vehicles or hybrids. And we're currently at 8% of our vehicles in Santa Cruz zip codes um, are low carbon which I should say um, is actually quite high. Uh, we are recognized as the number two city in the country in terms of new vehicle purchases that are electric. Um, and we are doing quite a bit to bring more built environment that supports um, low carbon uh, fuel choices. You may recall that we uh, wrote some proposals to access funding from Electrify America, which is the VW settlement agreement funds of uh, their emissions cheating scandal. And we were able to get named as the sixth metro area for investment in California. Um, VW needs to invest 800 million in California for electric vehicle infrastructure. So we have learned that there will be four DC fast chargers in the Santa Cruz metro area, valued at a million dollars in total, um, that will be installed in our community. We currently have one DC fast charger in the city, so this will be a considerable uh, expansion. Um, we continue to partner with Monterey Bay Community Power to provide incentives as well as the Air District for uh, low carbon vehicles, specifically EVs, EV charging, as well as supporting a number of our other initiatives. And then finally, there were a couple um, 
of our milestones that I was unable to update because I was unable to uh, access the platforms that we utilize to pull data. Um, and the first is reducing municipal energy use in buildings by 40%. We were at 7% in 2018. Um, and we've made a lot of progress on this front. 40% is incredibly ambitious, um, are largely due to our public works facilities division. We have retrofitted 97% of our lighting to LED in the city. Um, and we've taken advantage of all the low hanging fruit in terms of retrofitting HVAC and um, other kind of easy wins uh, on the energy front. Right now that division is working on a next phase of on-bill financing projects to do the next round of things, um, as well as uh, we just uh, had a kickoff meeting with an energy services company last week who is going to help us to identify what are the deeper next tier stage of energy efficiency and other energy related projects that can help us to reduce not only our energy use and emissions, but our costs as well. And so we're really excited about the opportunity that uh, partnering with that ESCO could present for us. They really bring to us capacity, which we're really limited in to analyze all the various opportunities, the data and so forth. And then the other one that we're not on track to achieve but couldn't be updated is expanding energy efficiency programs to 30% of homes. We're at 4.2% in 2018. So this is really, what are the homes that go through our green building program? What homes are served by Central Coast Energy Services who provides low income energy efficiency um, programs and so forth. And um, again, not able to access uh, the program that allows us to pull those data. And then what about emissions themselves? So our last greenhouse gas uh, inventory was conducted in 2015. Um, AMBAG is uh, conducting or analyzing, preparing the 2018 greenhouse gas emissions inventory, but 2015 is the latest we have. And due largely uh, to, or really solely because of Monterey Bay Community Power and their carbon-free electricity, 59% of that green stack that you see there um, has been eliminated uh, because those uh, that electricity is carbon free. So that enabled us to uh, achieve our 2020 emissions goal a year and a half early. And we are on track to meet the 2050 goal, which is to reduce emissions uh, by 80% compared to 1990 levels. Um, just a couple more slides. Um, we do have an annual uh, carbon fund internal grant program. Our carbon fund is uh, funded or, or has, has, uh, has a budget from um, a couple different things. Number one, we up until very recently received rebates for much of the energy efficiency work um, that we did in the past. And those rebate checks went into our carbon fund. We also tax ourselves 5% on all of our gasoline and diesel fuel purchases, and that goes into this carbon fund. And so annually, depending on the total between those two funding sources, we are able to grant between 50 and $70,000 a year. Um, in the three years that we have had this uh, program, we have awarded over $250,000 to internal city projects that are carbon reducing. So they need to be carbon reducing projects. And you can see what those projects are uh, for this year. You can see on the right hand side of the screen, the water department has installed their hydration station and bought their water bottles. Um, they're looking to get away from um, plastic water bottles as per a policy that was adopted by your council earlier in the year. This this carbon fund is really important because it, it often provides the last kind of marginal increment of money that might be needed to make a project happen. Uh, case in point is uh, Loudon Nelson's boiler replacement. They needed that last 15K to get it done and we were able to do so. And the sustainability team um, 
uh, evaluates all the proposals that come in and ranks them. Also, it's a really exciting time for us with the Climate Action Plan sunsetting in 2020. We will be embarking upon a state-of-the-art climate and energy action plan process uh, that will have a sunset year of 2030. We will be starting that. It's scheduled in July. Um, we have, uh, you will see on this year's budget, a $200,000 uh, allocation to uh, fund consulting services for that plan. We also have some money squirreled away from the carbon fund that is specifically allocated for outreach, including an equity outreach uh, advisor and facilitator. Um, not only will we close out our uh, progress uh, on the 2020 plan and determine, you know, where did we fall and where did we end on all of this? And what were the challenges and, and be reflective? But we will also identify the year and a pathway to carbon neutrality. Currently, we default to the year 2045, uh, consistent with the state. And we will see, is there a way for us to achieve that earlier? And if so, how? Um, as I mentioned, aligned with our health and all policies um, initiative, this will be an equity focused plan. <clears throat> Um, our Climate Action Task Force is acting as an advisory body, and we have added uh, some youth members to that team, and I will be uh, engaging with them to prepare uh, some of the equity pieces as we um, look to hire an equity professional to help us with that. Um, they will help to develop the scope of work, as well as the outreach plan that um, we really want this to be a community-driven, robust plan. Um, we also got word this week that, um, or last week rather, that we were successful in um, acquiring a Civic Spark Fellow, which is a program of AmeriCorps. And so they will be working, that person will be working in a half-time capacity exclusively on the Climate and Energy Action Plan. And then the other half-time will be spent in public works supporting um, those energy projects that I mentioned earlier. And finally, um, you know, something that, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of control over the built environment, but less ways to influence behavior change. And one thing um, that has been recognized is that cities really can't do it alone in terms of that outreach and engagement with the community and that there need to be good tools for us to point to for our residents and businesses to engage with, to understand um, you know, what, our, what our goals are how they can participate to help us to reach those goals, what collective action looks like, and to draw upon some of the best practices in this space, things like gamification and incentives and um, competition and so forth. So through this USDN grant, we really are going to evaluate what is the potential to do a central closed climate outreach campaign. And that's something I'm very excited about. Uh, we worked with Ecology Action here locally, as well as um, some other jurisdictions and other nonprofits in the Central Coast region to um, write that grant proposal and to hold that convening. And the last thing I really want to say and acknowledge is that, um, you know, and this is very much in the vein of health and all policies also, is that coronavirus and, and the climate crisis, they often have um, similar solutions, common solutions, and common ways of thinking and approaching the problems. And so, um, you know, to the extent possible, um, I'm really eager to engage with you, with our community, particularly through this climate action planning process, in how sustainability can stimulate recovery enhance, and enhance quality of life as um, we shift into our new normal. And with that, um, I will take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tiffany, for that great presentation. Um, I'd like to turn it over to the council members to see if anyone has a question for Tiffany at this time. And I would like to ask that maybe you use the participants um, icon and then the function that allows for folks to raise their hand. And so uh, I want to acknowledge uh, council member Myers. Tiffany, thank you for the, um, for the presentation and for all your work over the years. Um, 
it's uh, really great to see the progress and the fact that we're um, on track also for some, some really important things um, to be done as well as being uh, a number of items being achieved. My question um, had to do with um, the, you mentioned the um, single occupancy uh, commute ratio was the, I think we're at four percent and the goal was at ten percent um, I'm just curious if you have reflections on how how we might be able to get to that ten percent is that um, I'm just curious about whether or not your what your analysis has shown on that and then similar I just very quickly had a question also on the expanding the energy efficiency um, we're now at 4.2 percent. Um, our goal was try to get it to 30 percent, and I'm just wondering if that is kind of relative to available funds or sort of what the what the role of funding is on some of these goals. Sure. Thank you, Council Member. Or I'm sorry, Vice Mayor uh, Myers, <clears throat> for those questions. So on the 4 percent single occupancy vehicle uh, commutes. I think that you know we haven't seen the impact yet of the fi uh, my 511 uh, cruise.org, which is the RTC platform that was launched in collaboration with Public Works that enables folks to to very easily um, do carpool matching, to um, figure out what is their bus route if they want to take the bus, and a number of other tools. We have not seen the impact of that yet in our numbers. However, I'm not sure that that's going to get us another 6% uh, necessarily. I think a lot of this has to do with education uh, also, which is kind of brings me to the last point I said around behavior change and having the right kinds of tools to be able to proactively um, engage our residents and, and demonstrate the, the importance um, of these goals and, and this in particular. So. Um, I know that um, you know Claire Fleisler, our transportation planner, has a lot in the works and is constantly working on this, as well as our new transportation coordinator. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what is up next. I think continuing to promote the um, the new platform and the uh, downtown incentive package is um, high on their list of priorities right now. In mm -hmm. terms of energy efficiencies, uh, energy efficiency programs in homes, <clears throat> that one is really challenging. Um, we are not providing funding for any energy efficiency in homes. Rather, we are looking to, okay, when, um, when someone comes in to get a permit and if that permit needs to go through our green building program, we count it because our existing energy code is very efficient and um, so we count that. So, so that's one of the metrics that builds into this. The other is Central Coast Energy Services who do serve low income folks. So that is, um, you know, that's all dependent on the demand and what Central Coast Energy Services can do in terms of promotion. Their funding comes from LIHEAP, which is a federal, it's a, actually not a partisan, it gets funded um, in, with bipartisan support of Congress annually. And they actually just got a huge new allocation of LIHEAP funding that can be diverted to uh, COVID response. So I am expecting to see this year more uptake of that with that additional funding. It doesn't have to be exclusively on COVID response, but this is a really tricky one um, to get at. Previously, uh, Cal there was also Energy Upgrade California, which was a state program that provided um, home health assessments and um, energy efficiency. And that program, I think, you know, in our region, it did not have a lot of uptake. And there were, I think, reflections that perhaps the state marketing was not done 
in a good way. You know, I'm not sure, but that program does still exist, but it's not being promoted in our area. We do promote it on our website, but it's not something that we actively, you know, put funds towards promoting. So I hope that adds context. Maybe it doesn't totally answer your question, but that's, no, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Council Member Watkins. Okay, um, thank you, Tiffany, always for your incredible work and your presentation in the world. I am um, just sort of reflecting on that last slide. I just want to really just acknowledge and thank that, that your um, ability to bring that nexus together, really thinking about how climate change, how uh, the public health crisis associated with the coronavirus, thinking about health and all policies, that's been sort of top of mind for me. And I know at this time, we're sort of um, really getting down to the bare bones of what government does, but if and when a time comes that there is an opportunity for the council to support and weigh in and uh, participate, whether it be sort of the health and all policy subcommittee 2.0 or something like that, I just want to express that um, my uh, appreciation for you bringing that forward and um, interest in wanting to see us be intentional as we think about the next uh, kind of phase of our of our society, really. Um, so just kind of a few comments in, in that regard, and, and thank you again. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Watkins. Um, you know, just as a follow-on to that, uh, the upcoming MBEP virtual summit on April 29th will have a COVID and climate session. And uh, many of you know, and for, for the new council members, one of the implementation items in our health and all policies implementation work plan is to conduct convenings around, multi-sectoral convenings around sustainability, public health, and equity. And I can see a COVID and climate convening. And, you know, I, I have some ideas on that. My colleagues around the state, we've been compiling resources and articles and doing a lot of brainstorming around this. So yes, I think there's a lot of opportunity there as well. Great, are there any other council members who would like to um, have questions or comments at this time? Hey, Tiffany, again, thank you for all the amazing work you're doing. I think our community definitely appreciates it. And the fact that, you know, I think all of us in this community really appreciate, you know, wanting to preserve our environment and protect our environment as best possible. And it's just so amazing that uh, we have such a great um, group of folks working for our city who are committed to making sure that we're more sustainable. And um, with that, one of the things I wanted to do as well was, you know, this is this year marks the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And in recognition of that and in recognition of all the work the city's done, I just wanted to, I, we generated a proclamation. And so I wanted to read uh, some of the whereas's for that, of that proclamation at this time. And so whereas in this unprecedented time of pandemic and economic upheaval, as we keep close to our hearts and minds the deep pain and suffering of those who are ill or have lost loved ones, the sacrifices of all healthcare, service, and other essential workers, and the devotion of individuals and families taking care of each other, we pause and honor the continued dedication and leadership that our community has shown in protecting our environment as we recognize the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And whereas 50 years ago on April 22nd, 1970, 20 million Americans, 10% of the United States population at that time, took to the streets, college campuses, and hundreds of cities to protest environmental ignorance and demand a new way forward for our planet, launching the modern environmental movement entitled Earth Day, which is now recognized as the planet's largest civic event. And whereas the city of Santa Cruz has recommitted its climate action efforts through adoption of climate emergency in 2018 and a Green New Deal in 2019 resolutions and is set to embark upon a new state of the art climate and energy action plan 2030 process to acknowledge past efforts and reflect on how to accelerate progress on decarbonization and resiliency. Whereas important milestones in the city's environmental history include designating the Santa Cruz County Resource Conservation District in 1941 and the Monterey Bay Sanctuary in 1992, founding the Education for Sustainable Living program at the University of California, Santa Cruz in 2003, forming the Green Business Program in 2003, 
adopting the Green Building Ordinance and Program in 2005 and the first Climate Action and Adaptation Plan in 2012, reinitiating the Earth Day Festival in 2017, signing the Monterey Bay Regional Climate Action Compact in 2017, hiring a sustainability coordinator in 2018, opening the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Exploration Center in 2014 and the Arana Gulch Open Space and Trails in 2017, and establishing the Monterey Bay Community Power Community Choice in 2018. And whereas the city continues to receive awards and accolades for its work in protecting our environment that include the 2020 Carbon Disclosure Projects A-List Award, the 2019 Monterey Bay Air Resources District Clean Air Leaders Award for Municipal Energy Efficiency, the 2019 Institute of Local Government Silver Full Beacon Award for Holistic Climate Action, 2018 American Planning Association Northern California Section Award of Merit for Climate Adaptation Equity-Based Outreach Campaign, the 2016 Turning Red Tape into Red Carpet Silicon Valley for Green Wharf Eco District, the 2015 League of American Bicyclists National Bike Friendly Gold Award, and the 2014 Governor's Environmental and Economic Leadership Award for the Green Wharf Eco District. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of April as 2020, of April 2020 as Climate Action Month in the City of Santa Cruz in recognition of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and in honor of the accomplishments that the city has had in leading the effort to protect our environment. I hope that as we move forward, we can continue to um, accelerating and being leaders in the environmental protection movement. So thank you, Tiffany, for all the work you've done, and thank you, everyone in the community, for supporting our environment. Thank, thank you, Mayor Cummings, and I want to also just thank all of you for your support. Uh, this really takes all of us to get all of this work done, and um, appreciate your continual support for this work. Thank you. Are there any comments from council members at this time? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to our next item. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. I'd like to uh, ask the clerk if we can um, do a roll to see, roll call to see if there's any statements of disqualification today. Watkins? No. Matthews? No. Brown? No. Golder? No. Byers? No. Uh, uh, and Myers? Uh, Cummings? No. <laughs> I'd like to ask the city clerk if there's any uh, additions or deletions today. No, there aren't. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to speak on items that are not on our agenda. Oral communications will occur immediately following our last general business item. With that, um, I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on closed session for today. Yes, thank you, Mayor Cummings, members of the city council. Um, this afternoon, the council convened uh, virtually at 1.15 p.m. to consider the following items. First was a conference with labor negotiators involving uh, the SEIU temporary employees. Second was a, an item of anticipated litigation involving a threat um, of a legal challenge under the California Voting Rights Act, uh, uh, alleging that the city voting system of at-large voting uh, disproportionately affects minority voters and demanding that the city transition to district elections. Council received reports on both of those items. There was no reportable action. I'll call on the clerk to please provide any updates to the calendar. There are none. We'll move on to our consent agenda. These are items number four through nine on our agenda today. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to pull an item? You want me to do a roll call or? Uh, if so, I would just like to ask that you please uh, raise your hand and the participants uh, 
box. Council Member Brown. Uh, yes, I, I don't want to pull anything, but I have a question on item eight. Okay. Any other council members who would like to pull an item from consent today or have questions? Seeing none, we'll go back to Council Member Brown um, so you could ask your question. Yeah, um, so I have read through the materials on the uh, amendments to the uh, work by Dudek on the Graham Hill water treatment plant and the Newell Creek uh, inlet project, just for people who are listening who may not know what I'm asking about. I'm just wondering if there, um, there might be any delays in the timeline that you're aware of specific to the COVID-19 uh, certain circumstances that we find ourselves in. I know that, you know, there's site visits and, you know, a lot of other uh, on-site work that's going to have to be done, and I'm just wondering if you've talked about that or um, anticipate that there may be delays. That would be um, if Rosemary is there. If not, it's okay. I can get my answer my question offline. See Rosemary's video. Rosemary, we can't hear your audio. Uh, you're, you're on mute. Still can't hear you. Might need to try calling or see if you can um, connect your computer audio. Now, if you take it off me. Rosemary, we still can't hear you. There we go. How about now? Yeah, there we go. Okay, good. Um, so here's the deal. The projects that are being uh, discussed uh, particular item are the Newell Creek pipeline, which is a uh, piece of the pipeline that runs from the toe of the dam to Graham Hill. So it's not related to the inlet outlet project, which is a project that we signed the, um, the order to uh, proceed the, the proceed on earlier this week. And we have designated the Newell Creek inlet outlet project and the coast pump station 20-inch uh, pipeline replacement as essential projects. The delays of those projects would um, put us back as much as a year because of uh, constraints related to when you can work in the, uh, the specific environments um, and so the work that has to be done. So those two projects are proceeding. This is really for prep work related to the um, the uh, Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant and for um, a Newell Creek Pipeline Replacement Project. And that's work that is really just getting going. So at the moment, it's very much about uh, kind of describing the projects and, and developing the strategies for the CEQA compliance and the permitting processes. So there's not a reason that we're anticipating delays of that work. Yeah, thank you, and thanks for clarifying. I, I meant the um, the Newell Creek pipeline, but I just have inlet outlets in my head all the time because we were focused on that previously. So thank you. Appreciate it. All right, are there any further questions um, on items that are on our consent agenda? Okay. Seeing none, if there are any members of the public, um, if you can hit oh, us. Uh, Council Member Brown, did you have a, an additional question? No, no, I'm just raising my hand to make a motion oh, when we're ready. Okay. All right, for members of the public, uh, there are numbers displayed that you can call into, and if you would like to comment on any item on consent agenda, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will have two minutes. Okay, uh, there's one member of the public who has a comment on consent. Uh, you will be allowed to, to, to speak. Okay, we have a few people. So 
first caller is, um, you're on the line. Okay, that, that was a mistake. I was waiting for item 10 and I jumped back in at the wrong time, so cancel that. Okay. Okay, you're on the line. Um, I was also uh, waiting for item 10, so I'm sorry about that. Okay, great. Well, we'll lower your hand. Thank you. Okay, seeing that there's no public comment on this item, I'd like to bring it back uh, for action deliberation. And I saw Council Member Brown had her hand up. Yeah, I'll move the consent agenda. I'll second, and I wanted to just make a very brief comment on number seven, um, and really commend our staff in many departments for being extremely responsive to assisting our local business community in surviving and getting back on their feet as best they can. Item number seven has us um, passing a resolution to send, directing the mayor to send a letter on behalf of the council to the California Insurance Commission, urging them to process business interruption claims related to the COVID um, virus um, pandemic that affects our local businesses. It's one of many, many things that we're, we're trying to find how we can assist our local businesses. And I it's very on success. I just want to commend the staff for initiating that. Yeah, I think all of us can agree to the extent we can support our small businesses and all other sectors of our community that we're all committed to doing so. Are there any further questions or comments by council members? Okay. Seeing none, I'll turn it to the clerk to do a roll call vote on consent items. Council members Watkins? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Byers? Catherine, you're, you're muted. Council member Byers? Okay. You're muted, but okay. Aye, sorry. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes, <laughs> consent passes unanimously. Um, Justin, really quick, I'm getting a word that our audio is not very loud, so we need to speak up. Next item on our agenda is the consent public hearing. This is item number 10 on our agenda. Are there any council members who would like to pull this item for discussion? Okay, seeing none. Um, I'm not, wait, I, I'm not sure. You mean for us to talk about item 10? Correct. I have a question. Okay, sure. Um, okay. So there's a question. Councilmember Golder, are there any other council members who have questions on this item? Okay, Councilmember Golder, you can go ahead with your question. So I'm, I apologize. I know I'm just being kind of caught up. To speak. Can you guys hear me okay with this, or should I take the headphones off for this? You sound fine. Okay. <laughs> There's loud music in the background. Um, I'm kind of being caught up to speed. I know this is the second reading, but I have a couple of questions. Um, and I guess the first being like, does this include residential remodels or, or commercial remodels? Council Member Golder, this is uh, Tiffany Weisla, Sustainability and Climate Action Manager. This is only uh, for new construction. Okay. Um, and then I just, from, um, I'm just, I don't know, I'm just spinning it out, but I just have concerns about this in that, um, I don't, that sounds bad saying it on the record, but I don't really trust PG&E, and I feel like uh, there might be further blackouts as we see, like, fires and other things happening, and I think for many people, having gas appliances for cooking or heating water or heating their house 
was really important. And so I just am not sure how much of the power coming onto the grid is actually sustainable or renewable at this point. And so I, I and while I, I, you know, fully agree and want to have our city be as carbon neutral as possible, as quickly as possible, I just have concerns that a total ban on gas at the point. Councilmember Golder, this is Kurt Hurley. I'm the Green Building Specialist. Um, Hi. So over 95% of our community is served by Monterey Bay Clean Power, and both of their electric power offerings are carbon free. Um, in terms of the use of natural gas appliances during a public safety power shutoff, um, when electricity is not available, it's not possible to exhaust the combustion byproducts of cooking appliances in the kitchen, which uh, is very dangerous for the human occupants of buildings. Uh, I think you had a third concern regarding uh, the, um, the, the content of the power, and again, I, I think I answered that already, and if there was something I didn't address. Um, no, you, you did. It, yeah, you addressed it. Thank you. And I actually ran my gas, so I didn't even think about that, not turning on the fan. But um, the, I think the other thing, the other concern I have about PG&E is that I know that moving forward with solar, and I saw in Tiffany's presentation, like her, uh, the, the city's goal was I think 5,000 houses would be solar. I know at a certain point PG&E doesn't offer or doesn't let you let people get solar on a grid if there's too many people. I know a neighbor down the street that they're, they're just saying, no, there's too many people with solar already. And so I just, I don't know. I just, am not, I, maybe I just cannot vote on this because I'm just not comfortable and I'm still new and it's the second reading already. If I might, uh, Council Member Golder, this this uh, does not require solar. Uh, this this resolution or this I'm sorry, this ordinance. So I just want to make that clear. And secondly, if it is found that it is that a particular load exceeds the ability of PG&E to provide power in a location, that would be eligible for our infeasibility exemption. Yeah, I understand no, that it doesn't require solar, but my concern was that um, that if you gas is usually cheaper, and so for some people, it's, getting the solar kind of offsets the cost. And so I just think I don't know. I just I guess I have a lot of questions on it. It's probably just I don't know. <laughs> well, we're happy to answer whatever questions you have. I just have any concerns about just. Um, I, don't, I don't know if my question's right off the top of I, I just need, I feel like it was kind of, it seems like a lot to just ban something altogether and go for the session, so I think maybe just I can abstain from voting on this one. I'll, I'll turn it over to the city attorney to discuss um, um, your ability to, to vote on this item. I'm not trying to be a troublemaker right away. I'm so sorry. <laughs> No, um, but I, I think probably, uh, first of all, under our rules, you are not allowed to just abstain from, uh, from voting on an item. Um, an abstention is considered a vote against the ordinance. It sounds like that's the direction okay. you might be leaning, which is, which is uh, you know, a policy matter for the council and for you, um, but you can't, right. you, can't just, uh, subs you can't just abstain from voting on it. <laughs> Uh, Vice right. Mayor Myers, you're up next. Yeah, thank you. Um, we received quite a lot of um, correspondence on um, on this item, and um, it's a really technical item, needless to say. And um, actually, I'm seeing a number of opposition letters now that I didn't see really on the first reading. Um, I don't know about that. Same thing. Sorry. I don't know if the staff um, has had a chance to look through all of the um, the letters, but it seems like I'm just feeling like there is. Uh, I think last time when it came to us for the first reading, there were I think one or two. 
um, opposition letters now. It seems like um, there's a number more. I just was wondering if um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to understand and just clarify before I before I vote. Um, one is that, um, and Tiffany, I think you confirmed this, or, or Kirk, maybe you did, is that this only applies to brand new homes. So this is not for remodels or, or uh, things like that, correct? That is correct. And commercial, it's not just residential. Just want to make okay. that clear. And restaurants that would be using gas, like you know, most restaurants use much larger gas stoves. Um, if they are doing tenant improvements or a brand new restaurant was being built, could they they would still be be able to utilize what would typically be a larger you know uh, gas range to do that cooking? Is that true? That's yes. correct. That's correct. Okay. And then um, on some of the transportation questions that we've gotten, um, I'm just trying to understand um, some of these acronyms. So what is a BEV? So a BEV is an electric vehicle that um, has a demand of 4 kW or 4 kilowatts. And uh, this is Kurt Hurley, a green building special specialist. So uh, Vice Mayor Mayors, I've actually prepared uh, responses to all nine of those points. And I, and I also wanted to um, acknowledge that we've had many uh, letters of support for our community. And the comments um, from one individual in several of the second hearing comments were essentially a copy and paste of those, those comments. So those weren't um, unique comments from different members of our community, but those were, um, you know, those were essentially, uh, you know, copied and pasted. Um, so, but that, that, do, that, that doesn't uh, mean that we shouldn't review them, but I, I just wanted to acknowledge that fact. Yeah, I, I, I did see that trend. Um, may, I, may I interject? I'm sorry, uh, Vice Mayor uh, Myers. Uh, I just wanted to be clear that Kurt did prepare um, responses to all the points that were in, that were common amongst these, and we did send them to you all um, late this morning, so you probably maybe have not even seen those yet, but um, I just want to make that clear. Yeah, I did see those, and I got actually, I did get a chance to look at them, but again, it's just a little bit hard. Um, it is. Could you just, could you maybe just, I just have one question. There is a question around adding the BEVs, placing greater demands on the grid, um, and that um, this could cause um, GHG emissions to increase. So I'm just kind of reflecting on their climate plan. Um, and I appreciate the answer, but I have to admit I cannot understand the answer because I'm not an expert. It's very technical. Is there a way that uh, Kurt or Tiffany, you could describe what is in the, the response that was prepared and sent to us? But could you potentially look at it? Could you potentially just describe it a little bit more in a way that a lay person could understand um, what the expectation is with regards to um, that part of, of the that part of the um, the effect of the ordinance? Thank you. So, Vice Mayor Mayors, this is Kurt Hurley, Green Building Specialist. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to walk through that, um, making the point. Uh, so, if we look forward and we assume that in the year 2030, 10 years in the future, that we have 15 to 20 percent electric vehicles on the road. Currently, California is, I believe, a little over 4 percent. The, the the additional energy demand. This is this is an article in a uh, you know in a um, in a power industry uh, magazine, and they're discussing this. The the increase in energy demand is only on the order of five to ten percent. The 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 little bit greater change is on the capacity. So that means the equipment that controls and regulates voltages, the diameters of wires. So. In these comments, there was a mention of, you know, powers of 10, but 
the the annual increase in the number of EVs and this you know this is a domain expert on uh, on the power industry uh, the increase in energy demand is not uh, a power of 10 by by a long shot and actually it's the um, it's the peak capacity of the grid that's impacted a little bit greater but because the incremental annual change uh, is so slight, even in California, where the electric vehicle adoption uh, will occur most quickly, uh, we, we have plenty of time to both interconnect more carbon-free renewables and to make adjustments in the grid's voltage regulation equipment and retrofit those circuits that are uh, not adequate. And and further, I could share my sh my screen with you, but there are rates which give pricing signals to consumers. So rather than charging our electric vehicles during a time when the grid is constrained by renewable generation, we'll shift that charging to late morning, midday, and in particular when we develop um, improved capacity for charging electric vehicles at workplaces, that is inherently self-balancing in terms of demand and supply of electricity on our grid. So uh, I, I was trying to, I, wouldn't, I was trying not to do too much of a deep dive, but wanting to cover the, the actual impact looking 10 years in the future, the fact that it's a greater impact on capacity versus total energy, that there are strategies around charging and pricing signals, along with the fact that the annual change is incrementally um, of such a, a magnitude that there's, um, there's adequate time to both retrofit those circuits and and our state has a, has a very detailed roadmap on the interconnection of renewables to meet our 2030 and 2045 uh, renewable portfolio standards and carbon neutrality goals. Now, Tiffany, if you wanted to add anything to that. The only thing I want to add is just to remind folks that the electricity from Monterey Bay Community Power is carbon free. And so even electric vehicles that are charging are utilizing that electricity. And I wanna maybe put a point on the demand response. The evolution of our grid over the next decade to integrate smart devices um, in order to allow us to shift demand to different times of the day and so forth is going to accelerate incredibly. Um, and you know, and in fact, the uh, energy services company that I mentioned we had the kickoff meeting with, those are the kinds of things that we're looking for. So this, this technology is here. It just needs to be, continue to be integrated and adopted. Um, and of course, that will need to take place with, um, with PG&E as well as they um, continue to add smart devices to the grid. And so one assumption then is that because the technology would be um, boosted by these kinds of investment, of these kinds of regulations, that pricing on, so one, uh, many of the comments we also have gotten actually over the, the process of doing this ordinance is, um, you know, the cost of um, potentially the appliances and running the appliances. So what you're saying is that the data is showing that these things, uh, as more electric, uh, as more homes in California start to generate more, more of their own um, energy, as well as the grid as, as a total and community power, that we'll start to see those reduc reductions overall. Is that, is that one way of stating that, or is that just dumbing this down a little too much? <laughs> Um, I mean, where we are going to see reductions in emissions is as we increase the renewable energy content in the carbon-free offering, which that's how emissions will be reduced in addition to, of course, not driving gasoline-powered vehicles, which, you know, is our major source of emissions um, here in our region. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Golder. Councilmember Matthews, go ahead. Um, I 
clearly we've kind of pulled this from consent in a way. We're getting into a fairly detailed discussion. Um, I know that there are a couple people on the line who want to speak to this, members of the public. So um, that was just a comment. We've gone past the question. Okay. And I think uh, I do want to appreciate um, we did get some thoughtful comments from the public. I appreciate that. And um, I do also appreciate staff shared their responses with us. I uh, just want to put that on the record. So at this point, uh, open to, to more commentary. Okay. And then uh, Council Member Golder, you had your hand up. Thank you again. I'm, I'm seriously not trying to be a troublemaker, but I've been communicating with my friend who um, owns Sandbar Solar, and he was telling me, like, as we were trying our solar, that a lot of people think that Monterey Bay, um, what are they called, Monterey Bay Community Power, is all green, but really most of the power is generated via natural gas at the Moss Landing power plant. And so I'm just concerned, and then they offset it by purchasing electricity that's green from other places. And so I think, like, my concern is that, okay, if we're, like, kind of just buying electricity to, to or changing appliances to electric rather than gas appliances, but that our local power plant, although it's carbon neutral because it's purchasing electricity, from other sources is still using natural gas. And so I just think if there's other ways in the community that we can make households carbon neutral, like batteries um, and for, you know, or I don't know, but I I just have, yeah, that's my concern. Um, I'll go ahead and, and speak to that. So um, I know Scott Lasky quite well and um, uh, understand kind of where he's coming from on this, but just to be clear, what, what we have art been participating in um, since 2018, Monterey Bay Community Power, they procure electricity for our region. So they procure uh, hydropower and renewable energy, which are both carbon-free sources. Now you can think about the grid as being like a pool and everyone's putting a straw in it to sip out the electricity where all the different sources of electricity are mixed together, right? And so you might get the electricity that's produced closest to you, say, at the uh, power plant in uh, Moss Landing, but the real intent here is that because CTAs are able to procure electricity, the more and more of them that come online, that's fewer and fewer natural gas power plants that need to be utilized or to be brought online. So those power plants are starting, fossil fuel power plants are starting to become retired because of the renewable energy and the hydropower that's being procured by CCAs across California. So I think just explaining how Monterey Bay Community Power works is important so that everyone's on the same page. And, you know, that is something that we belong to, so it is a codified you know, policy that we support. And it is a, you know, the driving mechanism as to why this natural gas prohibition makes so much sense for us in terms of our next transformational emissions reduction strategy. You're welcome. All right. There are no further questions at this time. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to members of the public. So there are a number of um, telephone numbers that members of the public can call in on. Um, and what we would like to ask is that you call in on that number and please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will be set for two minutes. Okay. Hi, um, can, I, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Hello? Okay, great. Well, my name is Eric Rodberg, and uh, I wrote the letter that some people copied either in whole or in part, and I'm a bit offended that Mr. Hurley, I think his name is, 
somehow discounted that. I don't even know most of those people. I think I know one of the people who used my letter. It wasn't an organized thing. Someone had a, a um, post on next door that I didn't start, and I just put my letter out there. I think those comments are just as legitimate as mine. Um, and it's that people are concerned um, with this ordinance, and I, I'd like, I think the first reading flew under the radar, and I would like you guys to table this so that the community, until after the shelter in place ordinance is lifted, so that the community can have a real chance to weigh in. Because I think while your staff is very uh, much in favor of it, I don't believe that all of my questions, at least what I heard your staff say, I don't, I didn't think they were adequate answers. And as I said in my letter, I am totally in support of reducing fossil fuels, and I think this will have perverse effects. It's not just because of the electric vehicle issue. And as I said in my letter, I drive an electric vehicle, so I'm supportive of the intentions. However, this, also this idea that somehow Monterey Bay community power is green, 66% of the energy that they purchase is from large hydro. That's like saying nuclear energy is green. It, it might be emissions free at the point of generation. Think about all the emissions that went into all the concrete that were to make those dams. What about all the environmental degradation? And there's just so many reasons which I laid out in my letter and I don't have the time to go through all those points that I think this is not a good thing at this time. We don't have a resilient grid. You talked about making our grid more smart. We can't even get the community to agree on smart meters. We are so far away from having a resilient grid. And I'd really like to you guys just table this. If it's on hold for a couple months, it's not going to hurt anything. You, if you decide you want to vote for it in a couple months after the community's been able to weigh in, that, you know, just give the community a chance to really um, talk about this because I think there's actually a lot of opposition and people, you know, <laughs> you want to do this with the you support to, of the community. I, I and I think there are smarter ways to go about it. Thank you. So uh, thank you for hearing me. I hope you, if anyone wants to contact me and talk in more detail about the points I made in my letter, I would welcome that. Thank As you. you know, I'm usually. I'm, have to, I'm sorry, but you're over your two minutes, so I'm going to have to stop you there. But thank you for your comments. Okay, next speaker is available. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Uh, Michael Saint with Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, hope you're all, uh, I'm thankful for all your efforts to help make our community safe during this pandemic. Um, with that being said, uh, I'm definitely in support of this ordinance, uh, not only for environmental reasons, but for safety reasons. Uh, let me share some personal experiences I've had with natural gas. Um, Years ago, I actually, my face and arms were burnt due to lighting a natural gas water heater that had a faulty gas line. And then we all can remember Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989. I was coming home from the valley after the earthquake and from the uh, ride down from the top of Madonna into Watsonville, all I could smell was natural gas lines leaking. Back in 2014, I discovered a leak under the house, the natural gas leak called PG&E. It had been leaking from three to six percent. Uh, they gathered, they didn't know how much, how long that happened, but they probably thought that was from the 1989 earthquake also. So we were exposed for maybe as much as 25 years natural gas exposure. And most importantly, San Bruno pipeline explosion on September 9th, 2010, which killed eight people. PG&E has over 1,800 miles of gas pipelines. We do not have to add that and increase our risk of another San Bruno. So health issues, safety is the important part and also our environment. And a couple of the comments from people about uh, using COVID-19 to get this passed uh, is, is actually false because this has been in the works for quite a few months, nothing to do with COVID-19. And, um, and that's about it. Thank you for all your help, and um, I really recommend that you pass this ordinance. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Hey, next speaker, you're on the line. Is that me? Me? Yes. 
Hi, hi, this is Scott Lasky with, with Sandbar. And uh, hi, Kurt and Tiffany, uh, if you guys can, can hear me out there. Um, wrestling through some technology. But um, I, I did want to speak a little bit to, to this um, with, with some of my, my concerns with a, with a complete ban of, of natural gas as, a, as an energy source. Um, you know, the, the, the comment was made with, with NBCP being, a, you know, they, they buy all of their energy from renewable sources, and that is true. But like was stated, you know, you, you consume the electrons that are, that are closest to you, that are, that are generated closest to you, which most of that is, is generated at the, the fossil fuel plant in, in Moss Landing. And so if we followed that, that path of, of wanting to just have renewable energy or at least carbon neutrality in the way that we generate and consume our energy, um, you know, maybe a, a, a more prudent path to, to, to natural gas elimination as opposed to just a complete ban right now might be looking at, at establishing that same principle of carbon neutrality to, to, to buildings and, and energy consumers um, so that that way we still have the ability to, to use natural gas, but at the site that it's being used at, they're also um, either generating or, or using renewable energy that's generated at that, at that site to have either a you know, carbon neutrality or a renewable positive um, footprint. Um, I think you know, just completely eliminating that as, a, as, a, as an energy source is, is, is a slippery slope. You know, we, we, currently, we currently operate a, a, an 11,500 square foot building on the west side. We're right in town and we're not even connected to the PG&E grid. I just, want to, I just want to interrupt we, for one we have second to, use to let you know that natural um, gas to power our building about three percent of the year. Scott, the rest of the year, we're using solar and storage. Scott, I need to interrupt you for a second because your time's up. But I wanted to thank you for providing your comments. <laughs> do I do I speak again or? I'm sorry, I'm no, trying sorry, to get the protocols here. No, sorry, your time's up, unfortunately. Thank you, though. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Right, next speaker, you're on the line. Excuse me, uh, whoever the person's speaking, we can't hear you. It also sounds like you may need to turn your TV down because there's going to be feedback. I think we're going to move on to the next speaker. All right, you are on the line. Hi. Are you ready for me? Yes. This is Carol Paul Hamas. Hello. Um, Thank you for persevering through this awkward way of having a meeting. I already wrote a letter, so I'm not going to repeat the points that I wrote in my letter, but I did have a question as I was listening to the presentation by city staff about hydroelectric power. My understanding as someone who um, did a lot of work with native fish restoration is that hydroelectric power relies on dams and on water storage, which is detrimental to native fish and to the environment because it warms the water and other unintended consequences. So I'm wondering if somebody could speak to that possibly. And I also want to second the notion of allowing more time for public input during this time because I do think as I talk to people that a lot of people have opinions and uh, there's a lot of confusion around this proposal. So it might be good to allow more time for discussion. Thank you. Thank you. We'll try the person who was at 1810 again. You there? All right, 
right, next speaker. Um, hello, this is Pauline Seals. I represent 1,600 plus members of Santa Cruz Climate Action Network. We have attended two information sessions that Tiffany presented, as well as an earlier council meeting, and uh, we are strongly in favor of this. We would like to see it go ahead right now. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Hi, uh, my name is Kelsey Hill, and I'm a city resident renting in the Seabright area. I'm just calling to express my support for the electrification, uh, building electrification via a limited ban on natural gas. I want to thank Tiffany and Kurt and Mayor Cummings for leading on this issue. Um, it makes me really proud to live in a city that values climate justice and has a progressive vision for bold action where it counts. Um, I think that Santa Cruz is uniquely poised with our environmental history that Mayor Cummings listed uh, to show that this momentum is possible and it's beneficial and it will drastically cut our carbon emissions. Um, as a renter, I think that the indoor air pollution, more quick cooking times, lower utility bills, all of these are benefits that our whole community can see. Um, and I also enthusiastically support any local action that will help mitigate the influence of the fossil fuel industry. So it's easy to say that it's not the right time. It's easy for members of this diocese to question the model at face value without fully understanding the policies. But the bottom line here is that the atmosphere isn't going to wait for us to catch up on climate action, COVID-19 or not. So please Please pass this ordinance. I uh, thank you and uh, have a good day. Thank you very much. Any other member of the public who would like to comment on this item, please press star nine on your phones right now. Otherwise, we'll move back to Council for Action and Deliberation. Okay. You're, on, you're on the line. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm calling as a resident from Westside Santa Cruz, and I find that the ordinances that are implemented are constantly infringing upon homeowners that are trying to do what's best for their families. I've noticed with my electricity bill that things continually are going up due to the Monterey clean electricity that's being produced. So not only am I paying PG&E, but now I'm paying them, and sometimes they give me a, a rebate. Very confusing, and I just feel as though the public isn't being informed as best as we can as to the implementations that the diet is making on our behalf. I think we're seeing right now too many restrictions are being put on everybody, and one more restriction is just one more way of taking freedoms away, of letting people choose what they want instead of enforcing an overarching overreaching uh, ordinance to have everyone implemented under. I don't support it, and I hope those on the dais can understand that more than ever, we need to fight for individual freedoms and allow people to make decisions for themselves instead of having ordinances implement what we can do in our city. It's too much, it's overreaching, and we need to have our say on allowing people to make decisions for themselves. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to try one more time with the individual with the last four digits, 1810. Hello? Yeah. All right, we're going to bring it back to council for action and deliberation at this time. I just wanted to, follow, before we um, go to, um, before we take action on this item, I wanted to see if maybe one of the staff members could um, follow up on the question that was related to hydro, the production of energy through uh, hydroelectric. Sure, I'm happy to do that. This is Tiffany Weisweiss, the Sustainability and Climate Action Manager. What has been mentioned about hydropower in terms of disruption of the natural flow regime, that's definitely true. That it took a lot of emissions to, to build the, the dam, that's true. But what also is true is that dams are being decommissioned. And the more that we can buy renewable power, the less 
hydropower we need to rely on. But the fact of the matter is, is that it is our second least uh, environmentally da damaging um, source of electricity next to renewables. And I think it's important to remind you that Monterey Bay Community Power's renewable energy content will continue to increase as the hydropower content decreases. Yes, and, and this is Kurt Hurley, Green Building Specialist. And I just add to that that Monterey Bay Clean Power has two electric power offerings, and one of them uh, reconfigures the generation mix so it's 100% renewable and doesn't use large hydro. And that is, that is I think, one and a half or two, two and a half cents a kil more a kilowatt hour. So it's a, uh, it is an option, and it's, it's not a tremendous um, uptick from the 100 for the carbon-free option. Uh, to that point on Mo Monterey Bay Community Power and the cost, um, I also just want to make clear that Monterey Bay Community Power's uh, rates and are tied to PG&E's rates. So while folks may have seen an increase in their electricity bill uh, sometime since they've come online to Monterey Bay Community Power, that is not Monterey Bay Community Power raising rates. That's PG&E raising rates, Monterey Bay following suit. And then currently, there's a 7% discount on PG&E's rates that you get now monthly through Monterey Bay Community Power, just to clarify on uh, what's being paid and what's not. I had a couple follow-up questions on this. Um, I guess the first one's for Tiffany. Do you, can you just, so the public is aware, kind of state the different, um, and maybe the dates of when some of the um, public presentations were done, and then also when this first came to council? Yes, of course. So uh, we began working on this in the fall of last year, although Kurt and I had been um, working on the California Decarbonization Coalition to understand how the first wave of building electrification ordinances, um, how they happened and how they've been um, being implemented. Uh, many in the Bay Area were put in place in the fall. We did have, uh, since January, two developments developers roundtables, two public workshops, five morning coffee talks, one study session, a lengthy study session with city council, one planning commission meeting, um, and that all has taken place uh, between February and March, January, February, March. Thanks. I, I, I appreciate that because I think it's, it's important to the public that we've had, you know, there's been a lot of outreach and opportunity for the public to engage and come up to speed on this item. And so, and that we've done a lot of outreach to the community on this item before bringing it forward as an ordinance. And so I just wanted to make sure that the public was aware that, you know, there's been a lot of outreach. Um, and so, and then the, the next question I had, just for clarification, I think that in some of the comments that we heard, members of the public, uh, it sounds like they think this is a complete ban on natural gas, but I think the intention of this ordinance is for new construction and that if you currently own a house or you're in an older building that has natural gas, they'll still be able to use that. Is that a correct assumption to make? That is 100% correct. Great. So just wanted to be clear um, for members of the public that this is not banning natural gas throughout the entire city. It's uh, for new construction. So I saw a hand raised by Catherine Byers and then also yeah. a hand raised by um, Martine Watkins, Cynthia Matthews, and Sandy Brown. So I'll start with Catherine Byers. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Cummings. Uh, I feel fortunate I had an opportunity to talk to Tiffany this morning uh, and she it's important to me she outlined the exceptions. It's not just, it's all new construction. That's absolutely both commercial and uh, residential. But I think going over those exceptions for me were very helpful because as the letters came in, I found myself answering many, many of them. Um, and you almost, uh, now I have a question. Uh, you alluded, I was going to ask a lot of other uh, counties or com uh, communities or cities passing this. And I think you made reference to some coalition you work yeah. with. Yeah. 
but yes. good answer that. Thank you for the question, Council Member Byers. Yes, so there are uh, at least seven jurisdictions that have adopted a natural gas prohibition in California, primarily in the Bay Area, and there are dozens and dozens that have uh, adopted some form of building electrification. So this is certainly um, a trend sweeping California. It is supported by um, the California Energy Commission and by the state itself, this transition. Thank you. I'll, I will just add that when uh, I'm very supportive of this movement, I think it, uh, uh, it's needed, it's coming, and I don't think it will be as onerous as everyone thinks. So when we're ready for a motion, I'm ready to support it. Okay. Um, Councilmember Watkins, did you still have any questions? I saw your hand up earlier. Yeah, uh, Mayor Cummings, my question was what you asked in terms of just an overview of the outreach that was conducted prior to it getting to this place, and I appreciate you asking that question and for the clarification for the community. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council Member Matthews. Amplifying on that, uh, I know, Tiffany, in your report, too, you said that as a result of the public outreach and the planning commission meetings, that that influenced the evolution of the and I wonder if you could briefly just explain um, that that was not a performance exercise, but that it actually contributed to the um, products that we have before us. Yes, most definitely. Um, you know, the, the exception for restaurants is obviously for restaurant cooking was something that we heard early on. I'm going to let Kurt talk about how Planning Commission and the uh, the communications there uh, influenced some of the um, tweaking of the ordinance before it came for the uh, the first hearing. Kurt, could you take that, please? Certainly. Uh, this is Kurt Hurley, Green Building Specialist. So. Uh, Maybe we can just recount the exemption. So if there's a new construction that is using industrial process heat where an electric uh, alternative isn't available, that's an, that's an exemption. We mentioned the restaurant. We mentioned uh, infeasibility. Um, so we also have an exemption for ADUs where there's an existing structure, a primary dwelling on that parcel uh, up to 750 square feet. And we clarified that directly um, with uh, our planning commission. Uh, there were comments when we presented to them. So the prohibition as uh, it's, it stands before you has evolved with um, the feedback of domain experts that are sitting on our planning commission and, and the public and in consideration of what other jurisdictions have done and uh, some of the history uh, and how their communities have accepted or had um, raised, um, you know, concerns. So I think that what we have is something that's quite mature and that acknowledges uh, reasonable challenges and provides exemptions for those types of structures and designs where uh, the maturity of product offerings in the market is, is not quite there or it just inherently uh, it, it doesn't make sense. So um, I, th I think that uh, if there is another question that, that gives a, a brief overview. Thank you. Councilmember Brown. Oh, Councilmember Brown, you're still muted. Oh, I make it so. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. I think that uh, most of my uh, kind of comments or follow-up questions to uh, address some of those concerns that were have been raised have already been addressed. Um, staff, or, uh, Council Member Byers uh, raised some of them, and Council Member Matthews as well, related to exceptions to help people understand that this is not a, an outright ban. And the presentation that we received for people who are interested, it's fascinating. I shared many of the concerns that have been raised by members of the public and 
council members about uh, the prohibition on uh, natural gas in new construction. And uh, But the presentation that we received about the alternatives and kind of where the, the technology is going and the possibilities really helped me um, understand uh, that this is a really positive move and that it, it is unlikely to have the kind of negative uh, limitations and obstacles for members of the, uh, our community members than uh, people might think. So, but then I also just wanted to make one additional comment and, I, and thank you to uh, Kurt and Tiffany for all the work that you've done on this and, um, you know, and all the work that you um, have done kind of, you know, trying to move in this direction. I mean, I think I first talked about it with you when I first was on the council. So this is a long time in the making and it, it has been, uh, we've proceeded very thoughtfully and carefully. Uh, and then I just wanted to add one point about the rates uh, that Tiffany mentioned that our, that uh, Monterey Bay community power rates are tied to PG&E and I've been until recently the uh, policy board representative to Monterey Bay Community Power and there I learned a lot about energy markets and all kinds of other things but what I wanted to add here is that the just to clarify, the rate being tied to PG&E is not an, a choice for Monterey Bay Community Power. That is a requirement uh, for CCAs uh, that has been, uh, that's a state requirement, I believe, through the CPUC. And that, in large part, is a reflection of the, uh, you know, the lobbying power, the, the political power that PG&E PG has in Sacramento. So we don't choose to tie our rates to PG&E, and that's part of the reason for the rebate. Um, because we're trying to actually reduce rates for customers. Thanks. Okay. Council Member Golder. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody that's um, worked really hard on this. I appreciate Kurt and um, Tiffany, the work and the thought that you put behind bringing this forward. And obviously, I also support moving the city in a direction towards carbon neutrality. So thank you for answering all my questions and, and being patient with me while I'm learning how to do all this. Okay. Um, at this time, if there are no further questions, um, we can have a motion on the item. And I know Council Member Byers mentioned earlier supporting a motion on this, and I don't know if you'd be willing to make the motion or if another Council Member would. Oh, you're muted. Catherine, you're muted. You hear me? Now we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want a move approval of the second reading of ordinance number 2020-06. Um, looking for the name of it. Uh, new chapter 610 to the Santa Cruz Municipal Code prohibiting natural gas infrastructure in new building effective July 1st, 2020. I'll second that. So we have a motion made by Council Member Byers, seconded by Mayor Cummings to move the second reading and final adoption of ordinance, ordinance number 2020-6. And so I'll turn it to the clerk to have a roll call vote on the item. Council Members Watkins? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Byers? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That item um, is approved unanimously. And again, would like to thank all the staff for all the hard work and outreach that was done on that item and really trying to incorporate uh, the community's feedback. Okay, next item on our agenda. Oh, Council Member Matthews. Yeah. Um, this is obviously a very dynamic topic and um, without putting a specific date or expectation on a staff that has a lot to do right now, I think we'd probably all be interested in about a year how this has played out and what are the uh, issues that are arising and how many units are being built, et cetera. Just, just a touch point um, that we get more experience with. We will be happy to bring that back to you. I know you will. <laughs> 
So the next item on our agenda is a city manager report on COVID-19. And so I'd like to call on the city manager to report and provide updates on um, city events, business items, and anything else that relates to COVID-19. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I, along with uh, department heads, will be providing an update on service delivery in the current pandemic environment. Uh, we have the, a PowerPoint that's up on the screen. Uh, also, a PDF version was uh, emailed to council members if you want to reference that as well. Uh, the outline of the presentation uh, includes um, a brief review of the chronology of events. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, uh, Laura as well as a brief overview of our new world and ever-changing environment uh, responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, updates on essential services, which the department uh, heads will, will, will make. So that's, that's the outline. And uh, this will help provide uh, context for the next item on your agenda, which is an update on council directed items that we have had to delay as a result of the pandemic and what may come next. Uh, the events that led to our uh, current situation happened really remarkably quickly. Um, the, it was in late uh, December that the World Health Organization provided a notification of 41 patients with a mysterious pneumonia. So that was late uh, December. And by early March, both the county and the city had declared a local health emergency. And then by mid-March, uh, just a couple of weeks later, department heads met to develop new operational models, and a few days later, they were actually implemented. The county health officer also issued a shelter in order, place, shelter in order, shel I'm sorry, shelter in place order by mid-March, and by late March, the shelter in order uh, was strengthened and extended. And less than a week ago, the shelter, the health officer closed beaches and parks. Uh, although it's my understanding that we are now going to be uh, reopening up uh, beaches and parks uh, as the order will be expire on Wednesday, uh, this Wednesday at 11.59 uh, p.m. Um, it has been a dynamic period in a short time frame with fast paced, uh, what we've called here, action, reaction, and redefinition. Uh, and I just wanna give you a sense of that. Uh, at the state, county, and city levels, there have been multiple actions to respond to. Uh, state executive orders, 11 of them uh, and counting. Uh, shelter in place orders uh, that have come from the state and the county as well. Numerous uh, uh, press releases uh, and updates that we've had to do. Uh, we've also had to develop our own responses, including the eviction moratorium that council adopted, various executive orders that we've done at the local level, and uh, an item that you'll be uh, re uh, visiting later today, which is the, the uh, small business micro loan program. And we've also assisted other agencies like the Second Harvest Food Bank to deploy their uh, pickup delivery service over in the Beach Flats area at the uh, Boardwalk parking lot. Um, and moreover, there's just been a, a litany of requirements, regulations, guidelines, and other communications and protocols that we've had to follow and implement coming from the CDC, FEMA, OSHA, and other regulatory agencies. So just a lot uh, of work, uh, a lot of effort uh, needed to just uh, respond to the pandemic. Uh, and all of these things really uh, require considerable effort to, to review, to translate, uh, and implement uh, into uh, changes in, in service delivery. Um, and so uh, with that introduction, I'm gonna pass it on to first uh, to Rosemary, who will give you an update on the um, utilities uh, side of the equation. So, all right, so I just wanna talk about what our essential services water has uh, flowed un uninterrupted supply over all these days that the, um, the program has been going. The, the big focus has been on production of water, uh, treated water, uh, water quality monitoring and control and customer service. And our big focus has been on isolating and maintaining those areas so that they can um, serve and that they have 
lower chances of person-to-person um, -person spread. So that's involved things like personal protection equipment and OSHA guidelines and trying to really work on separating the staff in a way that uh, they're not overlapping as much. So with that, we've been able to um, provide ongoing service and we're feeling pretty comfortable that uh, although it's required a lot of changes in policies and procedures and structures of how people work, uh, it's working and people are getting what they need from the utilities. All right, uh, next is uh, Mark Dettel from Public Works. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Sector Public Works, um, wastewater collection and treatment, uh, we're actually continuing in a pretty much normal operation, uh, similar with the, the PPEs and separating our crews so that we, we are fully uh, operational. Um, we've had no increase in sewer spills or blockages so far. I wanna thank everybody for that. Uh, with the shortage of toilet paper, we have, had the had used increase uh, use of social media to remind residents uh, not to flush those flushable wipes. They definitely can cause blockages and a real problem. Uh, as well as refuse collection also continues it as a normal. And with the shelter in place, if you do have extra trash, please put the extra bag next to your container and do not contaminate your green waste or your recycle bins. We go to the next slide. Parking, uh, nothing is normal under parking. Um, we stopped charging for parking downtown and on the wharf, and we haven't, we did not charge the downtown parking permit holders for April or will not for May. The second quarter deficiency fee payments have been, have been deferred, and our neighborhood parking pro programs are currently under review as we look at how we, how and when to restart the paid parking as we transition from shelter in place to uh, back to a semi-normal economy. We do, however, continue to clean the downtown sidewalks with the sidewalk scrubber. And the parking office is closed, but we're monitoring email and outstanding parking citations can be paid online. And then next slide, please. Uh, construction in the city. We are paving Water Street, River Street, and we're using a cold in place recycling equipment that actually reuses the existing asphalt and it repackages it and um, adds an emulsifier and then replaces it. And that saves trucking costs as well as about, cost the whole thing about 30% less. Uh, we're also using any of the excess grindings as base rock material for the rail trail project, segment seven, one that's also under construction from Bay, Bay California to natural bridges. We're also constructing citywide safe routes for school crossing improvements, and we've issued potholding permits for the Soquel Creek Pure Water Transmission Line uh, as they get ready to lay out that construction. Uh, also, we're working on multi a multi-million dollar active transportation grant application. And even though our public is closed, we continue to issue permits over the phone and schedule per inspections by the, over the phone. And that's it, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Okay, uh, thank you. Next is our um, planning director, Lee Butler. Good afternoon, mayor and council members. We, as a result of the Santa Cruz County Health Order, um, have seen a significant number of construction sites close within the city. Um, nevertheless, we are still providing inspection services for uh, a number of projects that are exempt from the uh, shelter in place order. Those include projects with at least one deed restricted affordable housing unit, healthcare operations, emergency or essential uh, construction work that's needed for uh, health and safety of existing buildings, and then uh, securing existing sites under construction um, or making them safe is uh, another thing that our team is out there uh, doing. Uh, we're still providing inspections next business day and interior inspections of occupied buildings. We are using remote applications like Zoom or FaceTime to accomplish those. 
Next slide, please. Our website listed here has detailed information about the services in each of our uh, divisions. And um, we have expandable um, sections that you can see on the next slide uh, that provide details of each of those um, areas. We have a large lockable bin that we're using for customers to submit paper plans. Um, we're accepting email and permit submittals, and for larger plan sets, we're finalizing the process for electronic submittals with our team and IT. Next slide. Um, Moving on to renter protections, um, you can find a series of resources um, available from the city's main COVID response page. So the red banner that you see at the top, you can click on that link and there's a, a resources um, section on the right hand side. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that there is a um, FAQ list that economic development prepared in consultation with the city attorneys to uh, explain the latest uh, COVID specific um, ordinance that the council adopted for renter protections, both commercial and residential tenants. Next slide. Economic development has also prepared a housing resources card that is available from that link. And then next slide. Our city attorney's office has provided a very detailed summary of local and state measures that provide protections for tenants. And those are both uh, pre-COVID and um, post-COVID uh, issues. And finally, um, I just want to thank the members of our team and all the city staff who continue to provide services to our community in this time. I think Bonnie uh, is up next. Yes, thank, thanks. Uh, Bonnie Lepscomb, our Economic Development Director. Bonnie, you're muted, so I don't think we caught any of your first slides. is is uh, a, a mixed-use housing project that we submitted for for our Apple Tech Fund. Specifically, this is an 80 to 100 unit project, um, and we will hopefully hear back on how we're doing this on this in the next few weeks. Next slide, please. And um, specifically on the housing division, we're also looking really closely at the CARES Act on the COVID-19 eligible activities, and specifically on CDBG. We'll be bringing forward to you on the April 28th meeting um, the second hearing for the Consolidated Action Plan, which includes the CDBG recommendations, as well as the additional funding under the CARES Act for CDBG specific. That's approximately 282,000 that we have to distribute. So we'll be bringing forward to you the additional guidelines related to that. Next slide please. And on the business side, I just want to draw attention to our resources page, and this is at the, just on our main Choose Santa Cruz website. And if you go there, you can click on the COVID-19 response, and we have a variety of things there in addition to the items that you um, will be hearing about today. Um, next slide, please. We also have information on all available resources, um, info sessions, webinars. Um, we're also providing for our specific city tenants and businesses in the community technical assistance on how to apply for uh, grants and loans, um, including um, linking to our other area providers throughout the county. Um, we're specifically working with some of our city tenants on applying for PPP loans, um, the payment protection plan loans, and other loans available through the SBA. And finally, um, I just want to, next slide please, just uh, close out with um, an incredible uh, volunteer project that city staff um, are leading and working with over 180 volunteers and the generous contributions of Hearts Fabric in Santa Cruz to create over 10,000 
10,000 masks. Um, and the goal for the city is to have 10,000 masks um, for distribution to our unsheltered population, our, our city and county staff providing essential community services, and workers in key industries um, and essential businesses and other community members in need. Hearts Fabric has donated um, an incredible amount of thread and has been able to source elastic and fabric for us. And so we're just so appreciative of Hearts Fabric and all the volunteers in the community who have signed up to sew these masks for us. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Uh, and that's uh, Tony Elliott. Hello, this is Susan Nimitz. Can you hear me? Okay, you can go ahead, Susan, and then we'll have Tony come back. Um, right. And while the physical libraries are closed, there's significant demand for our virtual programs and services. Um, if you go to our website, you'll be able to see we've done a major redo of our, our website, um, highlighting local information and resources. Um, specifically, um, we've reallocated our budget to put more of our um, investments into online um, programs and services. The Friends just raised a significant amount of money to help us. Um, we're working closely with schools, trying to make sure that um, they have resources, digital resources like online tutoring, um, and um, we're just unveiling a program called uh, Digital Concierge, where we're helping school teachers find digital resources they need to teach their classes. Um, lastly, we just got a grant that will allow us to offer a free um, high school degree for adults. We're looking forward to that. It was a grant from the state of California. Lots of things going on. Thank you. All right, next, next we'll have uh, Tony Elliott. All right. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to share a brief update uh, uh, from Parks and Recreation. Um, all beaches and parks and trails remain closed at this time in accordance with the Santa Cruz County Health Supplemental Public Health Order, which was issued on April 8th. Uh, the current closures will expire on Wednesday this week um, at 11.59 p.m. Uh, and will open up Thursday morning. Uh, beaches, parks, multi-use trails, including West Cliff and the Riverwalk will all reopen on Thursday. Um, some of our specific amenities like basketball courts, skate parks, uh, beach parking lots will remain closed. Uh, but we are encouraging community members to visit the city's website for full details. Uh, and as parks and beaches reopen, the Parks and Rec Department is advising community members to avoid crowded areas, uh, make sure to adhere to social distancing requirements, and continue efforts to stop uh, the spread of COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. The Parks and Recreation Department's virtual recreation program continues to grow. Uh, through April 10th, more than 400 seniors participated in our online classes. We're working with partner agencies like the Public Library, Sanctuary, Exploration Center, and Coastal Watershed Council to bring new content and offerings to the community through our virtual recreation platform. And finally, our summer registration uh, for popular programs like our Junior Guards program and summer camps has been postponed, uh, but please stay tuned for updates and details uh, from Parks and Rec uh, in the coming weeks. That's it. Thank you. All right, next we have- uh, uh, Good afternoon, Mayor and members of City okay. Council, Ken Morgan, uh, IT Department. Uh, so over the past four weeks, uh, the IT Department has continued to work on essential projects while staffing our full service help desk. And like our other departments, we have been doing so with reduced uh, on-premise staff. Uh, we've been hard at work transitioning more than 25% of our city employees from working in the office to, uh, to working from home all day. Uh, prior to COVID-19, we typically see about 2% of our staff connecting remotely, and it's generally for intermittent use, so uh, this has been quite an increase. Uh, also, it's worth mentioning that 25% uh, of our employees working all day from home really kind of translates to about 50% of our office-based workforce. So uh, a huge shout out to the IT team, specifically the help desk, uh, who over the last four weeks have received over 450 requests for assistance, which is uh, about a 20 percent spike compared to the previous four weeks and even with that increase the team has continued to maintain the same time to closure for each of the work orders and they've also increased the volume of closed tickets by close to 40 percent 
Uh, every day we're hearing from employees around the city how much they appreciate having this team to assist them uh, through uh, navigating some pretty unfamiliar territory. Uh, last, just uh, some fun facts. Uh, Zoom has obviously become a go-to tool around the world for web conferencing, and it's obviously a platform we're becoming more familiar with here at the city. In the last four weeks, city staff has hosted 576 Zoom meetings, totaling close to 100,000 minutes and uh, with 4,000 participants. So all of us are logging a little more screen time than we're, we're used to. Thank you. Next we have uh, Lisa Murphy. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Member, Lisa Murphy, your Human Resources Director. Uh, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about what HR is doing. Uh, one of the first things we had to do was determine who we were going to uh, work from home and who was going to have to report to the work site with the closures. We did that quickly within three days uh, and with the assistance of finance when we had to determine how to uh, account for those who are working at home and those who are here at the work site. Next slide, please. A few things that we are doing here in HR, my full staff is working from home. They are continuing our offering our online training programs to all of our employees. We're still continuing to administer all of our benefits, particularly now more than ever, uh, they are busy trying to support our employees. We're working constantly with the unions on a daily basis, and again, we're working constantly with our employees to support them. And some of the we're supporting them is helping them uh, navigate these troubled waters, uh, both emotionally um, and at other, other emotional impacts that are occurring. Uh, we've been working hard to implement all of the new legislation that is fast and furiously coming at us. We're trying to protect our employees with new policies, health screening policies, personal protective equipment policies, return to work policies, uh, to emergency telecommuting policy, um, how to protect yourself at work and utilizing facial coverings and so forth. So trying to create this with the work of the risk management has been a huge undertaking. And it's just a reminder, we have also created the, uh, the city employee child care program. And finally, I just want to close out with, we are still we're coordinating with the other local agencies to uh, identify disaster service workers, of which all of our employees are disaster service workers. And it's also going out for assistance. We just fulfilled our first call uh, with volunteers, and that's um, been very successful, and that happened today. Uh, and I think we'll see more of those requests start to come in, and our workers will become available to uh, help where the community needs it. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Council. Next, we have our Finance Director, Cheryl Fife. Hi, thank you, and good afternoon. Um, currently, all of our finance staff are working remotely, um, they, unless they have to come into the work site to use systems that aren't available at their, at their home. And uh, we're keeping really busy um, uh, processing revenues, vendor payments, uh, purchasing purchase orders, payroll, plus keeping up with liability claims and um, collections and audits. Um, and also staff uh, is currently working really hard to get the annual operating and capital investment program budget uh, to you um, in May, as well as preparing for the annual um, audit and um, annual financial report. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, an update on communications from uh, Ralph Demericut. Hey, um, good, good evening, Council. So um, I'll start off by saying it's a um, really difficult time for everyone, and um, commuting on, uh, communicating on behalf of the city during this time, uh, it, it's a little different. It's definitely not business as usual. Um, to begin with, it's important to realize where audience is at this time, and uh, the truth is COVID-19 is impacting everyone, and it's a challenging time for everyone in our community, parents, students, uh, you know, those in um, the vulnerable populations, um, businesses, our own employees, definitely, and, and the list goes on and on. So um, with everyone having a hard time with this and having a challenging time with this, uh, we want to make sure that we're communicating important information that could provide support and protection for, for everyone um, in these audiences during this time. Um, so for our team, it's important that the information we're sharing is, is critical and it's timely. Uh, in addition to keeping up to speed, all the operational changes and decisions being made at the city. Um, we're also continuing to communicate closely with the county and we're following updates from the state and CDC to make sure that any new information, um, guidance or resource that's available is making its way to the appropriate um, group or person in our city. Um, and getting this information, whether it's a new order or what have you, to 
our constituents in a timely manner um, could save lives and could definitely um, prevent the spread of this disease. Um, as many of you know, um, times um, have changed and everyone receives their information through different uh, vehicles these days. And uh, our team is stepping up to that challenge and we're definitely utilizing every tool available to us uh, to provide a varied and effective form of delivery. And um, our communications team, it, it's made up of individuals from different departments and um, we're sharing our skills and resources um, to really help, help get the word out. Um, and. Um, on what each department is doing and what the council is doing in response to COVID-19. Um, we're very, very active on social media. Uh, so some numbers um, from, for you guys just to kind of give some context on what we've been doing. Um, the four weeks, um, the last four weeks alone, um, our posts on Facebook have, have been seen by 20,000 users and uh, we've got engaged from about 5,000 of them. Um, our tweets on Twitter have been seen by 35,000 people the last four weeks. Um, we're working with local TV and radio stations to help prevent the spread of this virus as well. Um, in the last four weeks, our team produced six PSA videos. Um, four of them are, are in rotation right now with local television and radio stations. Um, what this means, um, and for perspective, um, we uh, reached out to one television station and they shared with us that each video um, can be seen by 35,000 residents per week. Um, a radio station also shared that, um, and they're playing audio uh, files of our PSAs, a uh, radio station shared that they reach up to 78,000 people um, in, in sort of their broadcast um, between our location Monterey. Uh, and we're, we're remaining very active in ensuring that um, press releases are sent out in a timely manner as well. And with several pieces going out um, sometime within a day, um, we're starting to use live video feeds to connect with our community and we'll continue to do so. Um, Joyce with the police department recently uh, led an effort to uh, broadcast a, web a webinar sharing information on how businesses can protect their stores from burglaries and um, that went exceptionally well. Uh, we'll continue to send emails to city employees on a regular basis and uh, we have a weekly e-newsletter that um, provides an update to the community from the uh, city manager and it highlights a lot of the key actions made uh, during the week uh, in response to COVID-19. Uh, of course, um, I do want to share with you in the public that we continue to update our website on a daily basis um, where we're gathering all these resources and we're making it available for the public to see. Um, on, on our website, one of the more popular videos um, has received close to 15,000 views and it was just released four days ago and uh, this was the update by our city manager to the entire community on the city's response to COVID-19. Um, all this work uh, would not be possible without having an amazing team. Um, so I do want to give a shout out to them. And they also have full-time jobs uh, within their own departments, um, but they're still continuing to help with these communication efforts. Um, one lasting message is um, at the end of the day, our goal is really to communicate with the public that uh, our city is taking this pandemic seriously and uh, we're responding with vigor and empathy uh, to prevent the further spread of this disease into our community. And we're asking um, everyone um, to visit the website for information and resources and if you want to sign up for the city manager's uh, weekly newsletter um, to email city manager city mgr at city of santa cruz.com thank you uh, thank you, Ralph. Uh, next, I'm just going to really briefly uh, uh, go over um, our existing uh, response and structure just to, as, a, as a reminder. Um, as you know, the council declared a fiscal, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, health uh, emergency. And so we're under, uh, operating under emergency operations uh, structure um, responding to this crisis. And what's uh, you know, very unique about this particular uh, emergency is that it, it really is not just local or or regionally, it's, it's, it affects everyone throughout the entire country. And so the level of coordination uh, and work that has to occur with uh, our neighboring jurisdictions and the county, it's much more intense. Uh, and so there's the work that happens literally on an hourly basis with, uh, with each other. I've never uh, talked to our counterparts so often, uh, and it's just not amongst the administrators, but it's also amongst the parks directors, the fire chiefs, the police chiefs, and our elected officials uh, as they communicate regularly with their counterparts and also with uh, the leadership over at the county and the health department to uh, address issues and respond to questions uh, and to get informed and to uh, 
really uh, respond to the uh, ever emerging issues that we have. So accordingly, uh, with that structure that we have in place, uh, we it does require so that some actions be taken uh, immediately. Uh, and so there are a number of executive orders that have been issued. There's six, the, the most recent being the, uh, the cap on the uh, delivery, the commissions on deliveries for third party uh, delivery uh, companies. Uh, however, all of these have to be ratified by the city council and the emergency declaration has to be uh, updated uh, and renewed by the city council. So those will be returning to you at your next meeting on April 28th along with a, an update on the city's uh, budget uh, uh, situation uh, as uh, that has had a major impact as well. And so you'll get updated on, on those fronts uh, at your next meeting. The other uh, area that we've really been focusing our efforts on, again, it's uh, uh, led by the county, uh, but uh, really requires a regional response, and that's addressing the needs of the uh, the homeless or uh, individuals that don't, don't uh, lack shelter. Uh, so a lot of work has been done on that. A task force has been, a task force has been established, uh, focused on really providing uh, additional shelter capacity uh, and a number of facilities that have opened up to address uh, uh, the need for individuals that uh, uh, may uh, need to be quarantined or need or have vulnerabilities, medical vulnerabilities, and who need uh, particular shelter uh, assistance uh, in that regard. Uh, so the, uh, the hotels have been uh, acquired for that purpose. In addition, the capacity over at the armory uh, and some additional facilities have been added at the Vets Hall to do that. Uh, and in addition, we've done a number of uh, uh, additional uh, hygiene facilities throughout the city to be able to uh, uh, provide uh, hygiene uh, facilities for individuals. I was going to ask, uh, just to pause real quick, is there any way we can maybe either get the volume turned up or there's um, some council members were saying that they're ha having trouble hearing. Okay. You in particular. All right. Can, is this better? I don't know if council members can acknowledge whether or not the sound's better. Can you hear me better? No? I think like, we got a thumbs up. Okay. All right. Uh so with respect to uh, the unhoused population, just really briefly, I'll, I'll uh, summarize that again. Again, a lot of focus working with the, the county in particular, who's the lead uh, on uh, trying to respond to the needs of the homeless uh, population during the, this pandemic. Uh, the focus, again, has been largely on providing a shelter capacity for individuals that might uh, need quarantine or who may have vulnerabilities, medical vulnerabilities, and need uh, uh, special attention. These facilities need um, support services that goes with them. So a lot of effort's been placed on uh, acquiring those facilities. The other uh, challenge, of, of course, has been implementing social distancing requirements uh, in the existing shelters. And so capacity has been increased at existing shelters uh, for the regular uh, uh, homeless population in order to implement those measures uh, and to uh, increase capacity as well. Uh, we continue to follow the CDC guidelines of uh, not uh, uh, breaking up encampments, but in, but in, in instead trying to provide uh, adequate hygiene facilities and other services that, that may be needed. So we've deployed a number of hygiene stations throughout the, the entire city to address that. Uh, and also the county is uh, has deployed some outreach services and sites, uh, went over at Emmeline uh, and others that will be deployed to uh, have a place for individuals who are homeless who want to go and access services. Uh, so that there's a place for individuals to go uh, and, and, and seek assistance and, and get assistance. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll now turn it over to our city attorney, uh, Tony Condotti. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor Cummings, members of the city council. I'll keep this real brief. As you can imagine, uh, given the flurry of uh, executive orders, uh, court rules, um, directives from both from the federal, state, and local authorities with respect to the COVID-19 crisis. There have been a lot of questions that have come to our uh, to my office in the past several weeks. Um, we've been busy monitoring um, all of the communications that are coming out of the governor's office, out of the judicial council, which has promulgated emergency rules. Uh, for conducting uh, court proceedings out of our local courts. Uh, of course, the county health uh, officers, executive orders and the shelter in place order 
And so we've been quite busy, um, although working remotely in assisting and interpreting all those uh, directives, also in preparing a lot of the information that you have seen um, today and that has come from the uh, city manager's office serving as director of emergency services in terms of executive orders, emergency ordinances uh, and the like. Um, we've been working very closely with the police department in uh, ensuring that the uh, shelter in place ordinances are enforced in a, in a legal way and, and a lot of questions arise uh, out in the field when um, an officer comes upon some situation or circumstance and a person um, might feel that whatever they're doing is an essential function or an essential service. So we get a lot of questions uh, that come in on a daily basis and we're doing our best to keep up with all of that information. Um, and also uh, listening to communications from members of the public and corresponding with our city attorney colleagues throughout the state in what creative ways they are um, dealing with some of the issues that we've, that we've encountered. So it's all been um, very interesting, but also uh, very busy work over the last several weeks and in addition to just maintaining our, our existing uh, caseload. So, um, that concludes my report. Uh, thank you. Next, we've got uh, our police chief, Andy Mills, who'll do an update on the police department. Well, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council members, and uh, thank you for letting us update you. Our uh, operations are full speed. We are uh, working 24 hours a day. We have our officers in 12 hour shifts so that uh, we have extra officers on duty and uh, to be able to deal with some of the issues that arise. For instance, uh, we had a spike in burglary, commercial burglaries just after uh, the COVID crisis started. And as a result, I'm happy to report to you that for the last week, burglaries have been down substantially. We have uh, eight people in custody who were uh, uh, committing burglaries, some of which were currently on probation or parole. I also want you to know that other sections of the department are continuing to operate uh, efficiently as well and at full speed, including our recruitment and hiring of people. We have not backed off, that is uh, full speed ahead. We had to make some adjustments. We started doing interviews over uh, um, Zoom and Skype and so forth, so that worked well for us. And, uh, and we were able to uh, put three people in the academy that starts here in a few days. So we're excited about that, which brings us uh, to only four positions left unfilled in our department. And we have 20 people currently in the background process, so we're pretty hopeful we'll be at full speed here shortly, if not a little bit over. Uh, incidentally, we also hired two dogs. Uh, we brought two more dogs on the department, uh, two more canines, and uh, that will be fun. That was paid for by our local drug dealers, so we'd like to thank them for allowing us to seize their money. If you could advance the next slide, please. Uh, this is a current trend of the uh, of our dashboard for crime uh, here in the city, and you can see the uh, various uh, thermometer-looking uh, things, which measures the threshold over a seven-year period of uh, the month of March to tell you what uh, we're looking at in terms of crime, and uh, and it's all trending. Uh, down or staying within the uh, threshold of the standard deviation. If you could advance, please. Uh, go ahead and advance again. Uh, this is the one area that we're, go ahead back to our grade, if you would, please, for sexual assaults. Uh, this is the one area we're very concerned about. You can see that it has trended up over the month, and so I'm having the investigative lieutenants uh, a lieutenant uh, biopsy every single one of those cases to, for us to be able to understand uh, why this might be a little bit higher than it would be normally. Uh, certainly if this trend continues for a couple months, that may allow us to take a look at what the uh, precursors for this work and, uh, and then we can address those things, whether it's bars or whatever. So that's where we're at right now, and I don't want to take up too much time, but uh, uh, things are overall looking good. Our officers are working diligently with all city departments, and we're very grateful for all the work that all city employees are putting in. Thank you. Okay, next we have our fire chief, Jason Hyduk. Good afternoon, Mayor and 
Deputy Mayor and uh, Council Jason Heide, uh, Fire Chief. And first, I just want to start with that uh, from a public safety perspective, the fire department is fully operational, and we've made plans to make sure that we are able to sustain that uh, regardless if this goes on for a week or longer. Um, we, we have made a lot of efforts to make sure that uh, when the public calls that we are available and uh, we are here even though we've uh, had to change some of the things that we're doing. Let's go to the next slide. So one of the major uh, changes that we've had for us is we've activated our city emergency operations center and this has been done in a virtual manner uh, just because the physical location is co-located co with our 911 center and they've been on lockdown um, since COVID is a social disease. Uh, we're trying to minimize the amount of uh, interaction that we have uh, within our department as well as outside of our department. But the EOC is really there to coordinate all the efforts within the city. We have bi-weekly uh, uh, planning meetings and then we issue out a plan for that next uh, coming period. And it's also uh, tied with future reimbursement from uh, federal and state agencies, tracking our cost um, as a city uh, that we are spending money on to, uh, you know, for both city functions and more importantly for the community. And then within the realm of public safety coordination, obviously this is a public health disaster and the county has started a uh, department operations center in which the public health officer is leading that effort. And we've assigned one of our battalion chiefs to the public safety branch there to make sure that our needs are met, that that information uh, between all of our counterparts within the county, um, that we are working in a coordinated manner uh, to make sure that uh, when we have fires, when we have medicals, when we have emergencies, that we are here to meet the call for the public. And that is an ongoing uh, effort. And I'm pleased to say that we've made a lot of contingency plans for changing our service delivery, whether it's a quick response vehicle, mutual aid, joint policies for all agencies to follow for um, all of the public safety members. And those are uh, things that we put in place. Next slide. So some of the things that have uh, been impacted by uh, COVID, uh, cancellation of our regional fire academy, and as Chief Mel said, we are still moving forward with hiring. We're just changing the manner in which we do it. Um, that regional fire academy uh, was run through Cabrillo, and when the schools were put on hold, we had to pull our people out of that. We're making sure that they have the standards that are in place to uh, function as firefighters. We are modifying our training programs. Uh, we're not bringing people together uh, like, we've, like we've done in the past, but we are leaning forward for what the future holds. Uh, right now, we're still in that, on that cusp of summer, but we have wildland season that's going to be coming. And so we're making plans for how we're going to deploy as well as making sure that we have training in place so that um, all the members of our department uh, can answer that call. Some of the other things we've done internally is we've canceled our vacations to make sure that we have available staffing uh, for response. We have uh, still moved forward with vegetation management uh, for fuel breaks within our open spaces. Um, but we've closed our stations to the public. We're not doing school tours. Our administration office has been closed uh, for almost a month now, even though we are still available uh, by Zoom, by phone, by email. Um, and looking forward, we'll see when we can open those back up to, to the public. Our staffing changes within admin, we have people who are working remotely, um, and we also have people that are working on off days so that our office, um, we're not uh, putting as many people in our office as we used to. And within our stations, we've really instituted a, um, a pretty regimented um, program of cleaning all surfaces, of monitoring our people with temperatures, and just ensuring that we are preventing any contamination or cross-contamination as possible, but both within our members, but also so that we don't take that out to someone's uh, house or someone's uh, business when we respond out. Um, but again, we are still here, we will be here, and um, we're making every effort we can um, to uh, minimize the impacts of uh, COVID within our department, within our city, and within our community. 
So as, as you can see, um, our world has really been radically changed just in a matter of a, a few weeks. You know, we're responding to and working on things that we never would have imagined, uh, you know, not that long ago. Um, and so this essentially provides you kind of a context for your next item, uh, giving you a sense of uh, how everything has changed for us and we're really working on some things that are completely new. Um, and uh, I wanna finally just also thank uh, our employees and the community and, and council members uh, for um, all of your support. Uh, you know, people have really uh, gone, gone above and beyond to uh, respond to this crisis. Uh, the community is doing really well, um, and uh, we've been able to quickly respond. And, and, and it, I think it's because we just have incredibly de dedicated uh, uh, employees and members of the community that really care about what we do. Um, and, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, so with that, uh, we've happy to answer questions on this, or if you'd like to go on to the next item, that's uh, 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 up to the mayor. Uh, the next item it will be an update on kind of what this has, this has impacted in terms of uh, council-directed uh, initiatives from uh, months past. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, um, city manager, all the department heads, and I just wanna thank um, all the essential workers in our community uh, for all the work that they're doing and the fact that they're putting their lives on the line every day to ensure that uh, we continue to function in a way that provides food and services and safety to the members of the community. Um, additionally, I want to thank the council, uh, my colleagues as well, because we've all been, you know, putting in more time and effort into trying to understand what the needs of the community are, and then being able to communicate that, uh, whether it's information on food resources or tenant protections or information about mortgages, we've been able to take that information, communicate that to not only folks in the city, so that information is available on our websites. But we've also been able to reach out to many of our partners within the community to understand what resources they're able to provide, the best ways to connect people to those resources, and then understand what their needs are so that we can communicate that to some of our state and federal representatives and ensure that we have all the protections necessary during these very difficult times. I'd, always, I'd also like to thank members of the community who have really been doing their part with the shelter in place order. We have um, really seen the curve flatten as it relates to mortality, hospitalizations. We currently have plenty of space within our emergency facilities. And this is something that, although we're not able to test everyone in the community, is a really good sign that we've been doing a great job. And so I'd like to thank all the members of our community and also remind folks that we are doing our best to try to educate people to please not come to Santa Cruz for vacations during this time. And we also ask that people try to recreate near home and please don't travel to other communities. We'd like to ensure that we're continuing to keep our curve flattened, that we're not transmitting this disease to other communities and that we're not going to other communities, contracting the virus and bringing it back to our own community. So thank you all. And with that, I'll turn it over to council members to see if you have any questions as it relates to some of the information that was presented just now. And I see uh, Sandy Brown has her hand up. So I'll turn it over to Sandy Brown. Excuse me, Council Member Brown, you're muted. Hi. <laughs> so I would just add uh, my, my thank you, sincere thank you to everybody at the city, on our staff, who have been the department heads and city manager's office, and then all of the uh, workers who have uh, really stepped up in this extraordinary time. And some of you I know are taking on kind of non-traditional roles relative to your regular work that you're doing, and I just really appreciate everything that um, that folks are doing. And I also wanted to uh, say thank you to Mayor Cummings for um, really taking on a strong leadership role in this period. I mean, I keep hearing about uh, meetings that he's kind of convened and all of these different actors who and stakeholders who are really critical to how we respond as a community and how we begin to, uh, you know, formulate plans for uh, moving forward. So thank you for that. And uh, Vice Mayor Myers as well. I know you've been involved. Um, so, and all of my colleagues. I did have one question for um, Director Butler for the, if you're still around, 
um, related to because we um, so we uh, I received at least one. Uh, email asking about how uh, landlords are to uh, respond to their request for renewal on the rental inspection uh, uh, program for the annual, the affidavit that um, people receive and the statement that inspection has taken place for landlords who self-inspect. Uh, uh, um, given the shelter in place order, uh, is there some direction about how to proceed? Yes, the direction right now, thank you for that question, Councilmember Brown. The direction right now is to hold off on the self inspections until such time that the county health order allows for those to proceed. So we're, we're proceeding with sending out those notices. And um, then we're, we're suggesting that the actual inspection, the, the self inspect occur then. We've also halted our um, city inspect uh, uh, inspection. So when it's our time to go out there, we're not doing that right now. We've put all those on, on hold and we're going to reschedule them. Um, we are looking at certain instances where we may do some of those by Zoom, but we're, we're thinking about logistical challenges related to that, you know, smell of gas for example, um, that we, we can't really tell over, over Zoom. Thank you. Of course. Are there any other members of the city council who have any questions or comments at this time? Seeing none, before we move on to our next item, I just wanted to acknowledge that every day while many members of our community are able to stay at home and shelter in place to prevent contracting or spreading COVID-19, there are members of our community who we rely on for our basic needs, food, public safety, and health care. Throughout the country, numerous essential workers have died from COVID-19 as a result of trying to serve and help their community through these difficult times. It is not only important that we acknowledge the sacrifice of our essential workers are making on a daily basis, that we honor those people at home and abroad who have lost their lives while trying to provide essential services and safety during this global pandemic. To honor those essential workers who have lost their lives during these times, we will be flying our flag at half staff from April 16th to April 18th. And I ask that members of the community reflect on those, mem those people around the world who are currently working to uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19 and protect their communities during these times. And with that, um, we can move on to item number 11 on our agenda. Mayor, if I could just oh, really sure. quick. Um, yeah. In an attempt to fix some of the audio problems, we're going to hang up and recall and hopefully that will, and I'm going to turn off the mics and hopefully it'll reset something because okay. okay. they're having trouble hearing us for some reason. Okay. So we're going to take about a five minute break. Uh, to try to see if we can solve some of our audio issues. get our meeting started again. Um, the next item on our agenda, item number 11, which is a status update on various items on hold due to coronavirus, COVID-19 pandemic. And the presenter we will have is Laura Schmidt. And I'm not sure if somebody from community TV is. Oh, there we go. Yeah. All, right. All right, Laura. We'll... Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you well. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so item number 11, essentially the background part of the agenda report was covered by the city manager's update. So Martine and the rest of the department heads gave you the context of the chronology related to the COVID-19 pandemic <clears throat> and kind of what happened to our world and the, the new world in which we find ourselves operating and that although our essential services continue to be delivered, Every day we have to rewrite parts of them and constantly be creative and react and take action and redo or um, rejigger the way that we're delivering those services. So given this environment, 
What happened with uh, the departments and our operations is in order to stay vigilant and focus on COVID-19, we instituted in conjunction with you a laser focus on anything related to COVID-19 and those were our priorities. And essentially uh, the old days, some of you may remember this screen that used to come up on old televisions, um, the rest of the work went into standby. So given the pandemic's course, um, it's unknowable. We have a lot of predictive modeling that's out there, but essentially we're making a lot of assumptions uh, to come up with a best case of various items that have been put on hold due to our focus on the pandemic. And these are our department's um, best case scenario as far as what when we might be able to bring these back to council and restart them. So the restart date essentially is um, around the May timeframe for non-public safety led initiatives and more in the June to July timeframe for public safety led initiatives. That's kind of the bottom line. And then I'll go through these in a little bit more detail and all of the department heads are on the line and can chime in once we go through this and if you have any questions. So the camping ordinance, which is being led by the city attorney's office, the estimated restart date would be June and the first time that we would bring that back to council is in August. Assuming that July remains dark as we normally do, we um, do not meet in the month of July. Cannabis is broken out into two different sections for the new licensing piece of it. This is a planning and community development led project. The new licensing piece of it, they could restart it in May and would anticipate they could return back to council first time in June. And the other section of it relating to special events and on site consumption, they would pick that up in the June, July, August timeframe and return first back around the August timeframe. Again, for planning and community development, the corridor zoning and general plan updates, um, they are anticipating hoping to be able to pick those back up in mid to late April with a possible return to council in May. De La Viega golf course and the discussions around um, the funding model and operational model there, uh, they will pick that up in early to mid-May and we, um, the Parks and Rec Department would essentially come back to you with a conversation around De La Viega as part of the fiscal year 21 budget conversations. Inclusionary housing led by economic development, they would anticipate being able to bring that back in early to mid-May and then um, start conversations back up with you at council meetings in August with section eight housing being the first topic to be discussed. Project labor agreements, which um, affects many city departments, uh, water, public works, and the city manager's office, we would anticipate restarting that in June with a return back in August. The quality of life ordinances um, spearheaded by the police department, those would restart in July with a possible return to council in September. And preceding the quality of life ordinances would be the surveillance ordinance conversation to restart in June, return to council in August. And then the rental housing data also led by planning and community development and early to mid May start with a uh, return to council in June or August. So that's what the um, departments had come up as far as uh, the best case scenario. And then we'll open it up for questions after I'm just going to finish up with a beyond the pandemic. So as of now, the departments, we very much would appreciate uh, continuing to focus on COVID-19 so that we can continue to creatively redefine and rejigger our service delivery so that we continue to deliver the essential services to our community. We will be coming back led by the finance department uh, with a discussion with you on April the 28th and that will focus on our budget as it relates to closing out fiscal year 20 and the budget process for fiscal year 20 and what our outlook looks like for fiscal year 21 and beyond. And then in addition to that, the future planning of the pandemic and whether whenever the shelter in place orders cease, what the gradual return to life looks like, is it, um, is it a gradual return to life? It's not an, an open the gates and a, a flood happens. It's a measured and 
focused and well thought out return to life and how that looks for us as a community and how we support that operationally as departments. We also need to set aside time and begin to put those plans together and have those conversations amongst ourselves with our regional partners, with the community, and um, with our nonprofit partners as well. So that is something that we will have to take up very shortly and we've already started the conversations in regard to that. Martine, did you have anything else that you would like to add? Uh, no, I, I think that covered it. I think the, the that was a, just want to emphasize that even giving back to normal, which there's already an indication that uh, uh, that's going to start to happen, is likely going to be gradual. And that in itself is going to take some time to start uh, thinking about how that's implemented. Uh, and so I anticipate that there'll be additional uh, requirements for social distancing or other protocols that will be in place uh, as we, maybe we begin opening up uh, uh, certain facilities and are allowing for uh, um, you know, smaller uh, gatherings, for example, that sort of thing. Um, so that planning, uh, as Laura mentioned, uh, uh, has the preliminary has preliminarily just started, uh, but we'll need to have a lot uh, more effort in that regard as we learn more about uh, what that will entail. We do have an indication that uh, after the May 3rd uh, expiration that uh, there may be some relaxation. We heard from the health officer, particularly as it relates to perhaps construction, uh, perhaps golf courses, uh, landscaping, um, and then uh, maybe small gatherings. Uh, and again, we'll have to then see how that impacts uh, our operations and some of the work that we have to do, uh, and also uh, some of the, the projects that are on hold uh, and uh, some of the uh, permitting and, and land use issues as well and, and the timeline for those. So that's all stuff that still has to be evaluated and uh, we'll have to bring that back to you. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Like, All right, well, thank you for that presentation. And I don't, I'd just also like to let the public know that um, although there's a lot of topics that we want to address early on when we kind of knew that our the way that we function was gonna be changing. Um, I met with many of the department heads and we all agreed that it would be good if you know council members weren't bringing items forward. And so I sent the letter out to the council members asking that we not bring new items forward at that time. And just understanding that although we want to you know do a lot of things in our community right now, the most important thing that we can do is really stay focused on how we can minimize impacts of COVID-19. And so um, it's just great to see how how well we've been able to respond, the city's been able to respond to COVID-19 and keep things running. And so, well, I hope we can get back to some of these items quickly. I think that we can all agree that the emphasis should be on focusing on uh, COVID-19 at this point in time. And so I'd like to open it up to uh, other council members to see if anyone had any questions. And I see that uh, Vice Mayor Myers has her hand up. Yeah, I just have a question um, on two, two um, items that have been moving forward. Um, uh, the cash, uh, the finalization of the cash's work, Community um, Advisory Committee on Homelessness, and also the downtown library work. And I just, I'm assuming because it's not on the list that those two things would continue, continue to be um, worked on, but I just want to confirm just for the public. Thank you. Oh. For the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness, um, basically all the commission and committee work we halted unless it was absolutely necessary. Like planning has certain regulatory deadlines that are, have not been changed by executive order, so they're continuing. So for the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness, that did not have that in place, so we halted the conversations for that group. So essentially, it's a little bit of a deep freeze. When we come out of this and we restart, they would have probably, I can't remember what the direction from council was. I believe it was two to three um, meetings to close out their work and report back to council. Uh, I'll ask uh, Bonnie. And your can... second question, yeah. go ahead. Uh, if Bonnie's on the line, I'll ask her to respond to this. This is in the library project. Yep. <clears throat> Not sure if you can hear us. I, I can do an update if she can't. Bonnie, if you're talking, we can't hear you. You might be uh, muted. This is 
funny. I wasn't sure if, if uh, it would be me or, or uh, Susan, but I'm happy to talk. Yes, we are continuing with the work on the library project. We have an um, architect team um, right now working on an apples-to-apples -apples comparison from the first scope, which was looking at the uh, rehab of the existing library, and we're now looking at the alternative site and um, looking at the costs of a potential mixed-use project that includes housing there. And we're on track at this point to come back to council in June. I also had a question, um, or are there any, um, Councilmember Myers, do you have, did you need any more follow-up on that, or is that good? Are there any other council members with questions at this time? I did have two questions. I was just wondering, because I know um, a few months ago there was an item as it relates to women's health, and then also the Beach Impact Fund, and I was wondering if those items are also on hold or if those, or what state those might be coming back to council? The, uh, with respect to the impact fund, that, that is on, on hold. Um, and with, with respect to the, uh, the second item, this was the women's. Yeah, it was like I'm trying to call that one. Women the, the men, I think the menstrual equity item was okay. supposed to be incorporated into the fiscal year 21 conversation. Right. So that right. wouldn't come back as part of the budgeting and the 21 conversation when you guys do the budget hearing. Okay, thank you. That's, that's all the questions I had. Oh, and then actually, no, I had one more um, around strategic planning when there might be, when that might be coming back as well. Yeah, I think that's another one that uh, um, we, well, we'll have to. Um... Martine, I can a I can answer that one. Okay, go ahead, Laura. So we met with Nicole Young, who is our consultant spearheading the um, strategic plan process, and the month of April was supposed to be our community outreach process. So she initially spearheaded an internal outreach process. And she has all that information from all the departments and she's collating and making um, some sense of all of that feedback. And then um, she'll, we meet with her once a month. So our next meeting with her will be at the end of this month in April to see where things stand. And um, once we're able to pick up the community conversations again, that will be the next step. And then the cycle back to council will be a month to a month and a half after we do the community outreach sessions. Great. Thanks for that update. You're welcome. The other thing I just wanted to add too that uh, is uh, another uh, sort of consideration here too is that uh, obviously the fiscal situation will also play a major role in uh, many of these projects and how they're impacted too. So again, you'll get a sense of that on April 28th, but I can tell you now that it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not very positive uh, uh, situation and it's not something that we're gonna recover from really quickly. So that'll be the other sort of uh, part of the analysis that we'll have to incorporate in terms of uh, some of these uh, projects uh, um, as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Matthews. I really appreciate your admonition to not be <laughs> piling on new initiatives right now and also being quite realistic about what we're facing in terms of budget issues uh, coming in. And, and just, I guess, the question to Laura or the team working on the strategic planning, uh, given the situation we're in and the timeline you've laid out, by the time we actually get to strategic planning, the current council will have just a few months left. And it, it seems a little odd, frankly, um, <laughs> given all of that, <laughs> to make all this effort for this current council to develop a plan and, and think of different people. You know, there's, there's gonna be some, this, this definitely falls into the, the, we don't know the course of the pandemic and what the timing's going to look like. Nicole's been very flexible as far as the timing and our work with her. So we can definitely make adjustments depending upon what the situation is looking like so that um, putting together a strategic plan makes sense timing-wise as far as the council makeup and the election process. 
and I guess a, a final comment, just given what we already have, that's really big stuff. We haven't talked about the war. We haven't talked about the Pacific Station, the Metro. I mean, there's some even other big things, and we are going to have pretty restricted capacity, it seems, um, in the immediate future. That's right. Yeah, that seems to be the case, absolutely. Okay, um, if there are no further questions at this time, uh, what we can do is we can turn it over to public comment. And so there's a uh, series of numbers that are gonna be projected onto the screen. If you're interested in commenting on item number 11, which is a status update on the various items on hold due to the coronavirus pandemic, um, please call in on one of those numbers. And after you call in, please enter the meeting ID. And when prompted to, uh, for a participate ID, please press pound. If you'd like to comment, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And it was, when it's your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer would be set for two minutes. So if you'd like to speak on this item, please press star nine on your phone to acknowledge that you would like to speak to this item and we will unmute you to speak. Okay, you have two minutes to speak and you're on the line. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm Robert Norris of Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom. I'm concerned that this item 11 is another example of handing over all power to the city manager to prioritize items which are to be postponed, which are to be sped up, and you know, which deleted entirely. The city manager's department under Martine Bernal and Susie O'Hara has been obsessively committed to a failed inadequate and unconstitutional series of what are essentially reassurances uh, for non-existent housing and shelter for homeless people. Anyone who drives along Coral Street, the River Levee, dares to walk in the pub nip, can see the falseness of these so-called shelter availability claims. The public needs to have real public input into this process of which items are go and which are not. Not be allowed as a tiny sound bite at a point where it is poised for rubber stamping by a complacent and reactionary council now safely in the hands of an old guard. There was nothing regarding survival encampments uh, on this list of items that are even going to be looked at in the future about a time certain, which provides, as we speak, essential self-imposed shelter for over a thousand unhoused folks outside. The examination of harsh ordinances was proposed by Councilmember Glover over a year ago. It's completely missing from the schedule. These laws, stay away laws in the parks, trespass on private property, closed area laws, open container, many more, these are used currently to waste public money, waste police time, target homeless people, and are the model for today's developing police state model. And they have entirely disappeared from the staff report. These are my concerns, and I ask the community to, uh, to act on them since the council, unfortunately, looks like it's going to just do the usual pass. Thanks. Thank you. If there's any other member of the public who'd like to speak on this item, please call one of the numbers that's shown on the screen and then press star nine on your phone. All right, you are on the line. Hi, this is uh, Pat Malo, um, a WAM board member, Green Trade, uh, grew up here, lived here my whole life, and hoping to stay. Um, first, let me thank everyone who's been working on this. Um, I think that it's a trying time for everyone, no matter where you're at and what you're doing. So I want to thank the council and staff and the entire community, um, especially those who have this has been the hardest. Um, I just want to say one thing. Um, about the cannabis policy um, stuff. We're really, you know, happy to see some of this public event stuff and things pushed off a little bit into June. You know, we're blessed to still be in the conversation. But I just want to acknowledge that we have major issues regarding the ownership transfer 
and um, just the high taxes and um, just rough issues that the local cannabis industry was facing before this. Um, we saw a lot of headlines, unfortunately, about oh, biggest you know sales days and records and all this, but really you know sales at retail things, even though they're essential, have been down 30 percent across the state, and that's true locally as well. And a lot of these local businesses were on thin ice to begin with. I mean, I think two years, almost you know, year and a half ago, we had the majority of the last last council. Um, vote unanimously to be able to like give some immediate relief on taxes, um, solve some of these ownership issues, and really just acknowledge that this is an industry that used to employ a huge amount of people in the medical cannabis industry, and now this legal cannabis regulated industry is on the verge of failure. So I really, you know, thank you guys for everything you're doing, and I understand there's far bigger priorities out there, but I just had to say all that. Thanks. Thank you. Seeing no further um, members of the public who wish to speak on this item, um, I see Council Member Watkins has her hand raised. All right, uh, I just want to thank everybody for the presentation um, for the pr prior item as well as this item and bringing it forward. Um, just extend the comments that were made by the mayor and others and expressing our gratitude to all, all of our essential workers for doing the best they can to navigate these really challenging times. Um, I guess my comment, and then I'm prepared to move the recommendation, is um, I think we have a lot of unknowns, and as we really look forward forward, um, try to predict where we're going to be. I think there's going to be a lot that we're going to need to do to think about resilience and recovery. And I realize that some of these items were sort of in the immediate uh, uh, horizon, but uh, also recognize that as we start to dive into our budget and start to really look at priorities and rebuilding not only um, uh, some fixes for what was just brought up with the cannabis uh, industry, but also for our entire economy and our small businesses, there's going to be a lot uh, of work to be done. So um, I just want to acknowledge and recognize that uh, absolutely this, this is appropriate to put on hold at this time um, and acknowledge and thank everybody who's uh, an essential worker and beyond doing what they can to um, navigate the city as we move forward with COVID-19 and, and its impacts. Um, and then also with a recognition of the fact that uh, the budget is going to be a real uh, challenging time and, and probably pretty decisive when we think about how we're going to need to prioritize and structure things moving forward. Um, so with those comments, I'm, I'm prepared to move the recommendation as presented to um, receive this update from staff regarding the various council assigned items and have temporarily put on hold uh, due to COVID-19, uh, the pandemic. I'll second, I'll second that. Um, Council Member Myers, or Vice Mayor Myers, sorry. I was, I was gonna second it, but no worries. Okay. Are there any other comments by council members? Seeing none, we have a motion that was made by uh, Council Member Watkins, seconded by Mayor Cummings um, to accept the staff recommendations. And so I'll turn it back to the clerk for a roll call vote. Council members Watkins? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Boulder? Aye. And council member Byers is absent. She signed off at five o'clock. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes unanimously. We will move on to- Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for the, for the presentation and for bringing that to us. And that takes us to our last item of the evening, which is uh, Santa Cruz Re Resiliency Microloan Program Budget Adjustment. And I'll turn that over to Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to share my screen. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so 
I'm excited to, to bring this program uh, together for your consideration today, and I want to first acknowledge actually the mayor who um, first convened a meeting uh, with a number of local banks and credit unions to really start the conversation about what is happening in our business community right now, how is it going with the uh, CARES Act funding, with the pay, uh, Paycheck Protection Program and the injury loans, and how could we help? So this really started the conversation. And from that conversation, we had a series of follow-up conversations with Santa Cruz Community Credit Union, and they've agreed to partner with us on a program. So this is really a joint effort, um, and I'll just go into some of the details, and then afterwards, after the brief presentation, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, and before I kick off on that, I also want to acknowledge the hard work of staff. This has been, because this is an emergency program, we have been... Um, it's definitely happening in, in real time, and our ED um, staff division, and that's um, Kathy Mintz and um, Rebecca Unit, our business liaison, have been working really hard. In fact, right now, I know that Rebecca's working on the online application um, draft, and um, I know that Rebecca's also working, and Kathy's also working on the MOU. Um, so we want to make sure that if you approve this today, that we can hit the ground running and really get this out in the community soon. Okay, so um, I first just want to say, as part of this program, that we do have a considerable number of business resources um, that are available, and they're on our landing page at just choosesantacruz.com. And um, when you go to the site, there is an, an, a bar at the, across the top, a banner, where you can click on the COVID-19 resources. And we have um, everything there um, that is uh, available as far as funding, resources, webinars. We even archive the webinar after they happen, um, links to other partner agencies and resources in the community, and then links to CARES Act and other, other state, local, and federal um, programs, as well as local efforts uh, like Right Out the Wave. So there's a lot of um, information there for the community. So how we're looking at um, the COVID-19 response as far as our business community is we're looking at three stages of re resiliency support. Right now, we're in the survival and sort of the rescue stage, and we see that as sort of March through May. And where we come in right now is looking at the immediate needs of the business community, what's not being met by some of the federal programs, what are things we can do at the city, and I'll go into that a little bit more. Additionally, the phase two would be stabilization and that starts sort of overlaps with the survival and that starts in May and goes through October. And that's when more substantial assistance is available, some of that through the federal funding programs, through the SBA, Small Business Administration loans, um, grants, um, through the CARES Act and other assistance that we hope will be coming, will be coming our way for local and small businesses. And then finally, we see a sort of late 2020 and beyond. We see that as the third phase, which is recovery and rebuilding. And that's that's really similar to um, the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989. We see that as, as some of the largest needs we'll have in the community for permanent working capital, fixed assets, um, some major reinvestment to stimulate the economy and provide jobs. So we'll go into that briefly as, as we go forward. So stage one, survival and rescue. Um, we've been through, you've um, actually had presentations on a number of these earlier today, so I won't go into these, but these are the things that we've been doing at the city to really help our larger and broader business community um, really move, move forward, including uh, other departments um, and like a parking division, as our public works de uh, develop, director mentioned earlier, specifically on uh, parking and free parking available now and deferments on our parking deficiency fees and just anything we can do within the city's control to really support businesses so that they can survive this, this crisis or the things that we're doing internally at the city. Um, and that's where this program comes in. So uh, this program, what we're calling right now, um, is the Santa Cruz Resilience Microloan Program. And this is, uh, our proposal is to fund this through the Economic Development Trust Fund. And just briefly, a little background on what that fund is. That fund was created um, following the uh, dissolution of the Redevelopment Agency in 2012. So uh, some of you may remember Measure Q, which was a transient occupancy tax measure 
measure, a TOT measure that increased the TOT by a percent. And at that time, um, part of the outreach and commitment to the community was that we would, with the loss of redevelopment, that we would set aside and develop a specific fund um, whose purpose and focus was to um, continue some of the work that council had approved from the former RDA of economic development projects and initiatives to create jobs and stimulate the economy. So that's what the fund was created for. And it has been around since then. We have funded a few projects over the last few years. We do have a fund balance currently in that fund of about $4 million, And we're proposing today and recognize that during this crisis there are going to be other needs um, that may take precedence for some of that funding. But we are hopeful um, that we can set aside 500000 for this program now to meet this emergent need in our community. So, as I mentioned earlier, this uh, program, program is proposed to be formed in partnership with the Santa Cruz Community Credit Union, and um, we're really focusing the program on, t on vulnerable businesses in our city, small businesses specifically, and it's um, designed to provide a quick response loan to help as many businesses as possible survive until early May when hopefully some of the federal aid through the CARES Act will be more, more forthcoming. It's to stabilize businesses right now due to the drop in the economic activity. Our program really complements the Paycheck Protection Program, and that's some of the feedback that we've had some of our area banks is just the timing of that, even though that's an expedited program, it's still not soon enough to help some of our businesses, particularly our brick-and-mortar businesses um, that really survive restaurant, retail with storefronts um, on working capital. Um, so why a loan program and not a grant? Um, specifically, again, we're trying to provide emergency capital to our struggling businesses. Um, while grants would have been an option or could be, um, it, it really would work in order for a grant program to really work well, we would have to more broadly distribute it to businesses in the community. We would need a much larger fund to make that possible. And what we are really trying to do is to design and look at that emergency need of mo those most vulnerable vulnerable and provide these bridge loans until CARES Act funding comes forward and that funding is available. I mean, we can't hear you anymore. I'm not sure if something happened to your audio. Bonnie, we still aren't able to hear you. Something happened to your audio. Okay. Looks like we're having some technical difficulties, so we'll... Um, just hang on for a second, see if we can get Bonnie Lipscomb back on the line.
Why don't we take a short break until we can get Bonnie back on? I talked about the Economic Development Trust Fund? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I was probably here. Did I talk about the two types of applicants for the funding? This is where we it's lost you. That's where it crashed. Okay, so I'll start from here. Sounds good. Okay, <laughs> tell me when um, we're live. It looks like we are live. Oh, okay, great. So I apologize for the break in the audio. And I think where we left off when my audio went out was I was just starting to talk about the two types of applicants for the funding. Specifically, we are looking at those that don't need bridge funding or those that need bridge funding for working capital while they're waiting for their larger paycheck protection program funding or their economic injury disaster loans through the Small Business Administration. And we're finding many, because those programs are so designed, and particularly the PPP program, the pay Paycheck Protection Program, which is forgivable funding, um, every small business, if they can, should be applying for those funds. However, they just due to some of the delay in um, the federal government of processing them and clarifying guidelines, not everyone can get that money right of way, right away. So we really see a need locally to be able to provide three-month term no-interest loans, which are basically bridge funding for some of our small businesses in our community. Our local banks that are providing these are, are processing these as quickly as they can. They are getting these out into the community, but there's still a broader need that's unmet. Our second category uh, for applicants that we're looking at to fund are for those businesses that are um, may not be well served by some of the other lending programs. Either they don't have, um, either they lack an established banking rate relationship with a bank that is providing the um, SBA CARES Act loans, um, or there's just some other criteria criteria for some reason that makes them not a good candidate for those loans. Um, so for those uh, small businesses, and again, we're really looking at those um, bricks and mortar businesses with a storefront um, that have really high working capital needs and yet are either closed or um, are operating, you know, at a very minimal capacity right now. So these would be low interest loans, one to three percent, terms um, ranging between 18 months and three years, and no payment for the first six months. So we created a landing page on our website, and um, you can just go to, again to choosesantacruz.com and um, micro, micro loan. And we are hoping, if this is approved by council today, um, that we could actually be in a position to open this to the public as soon as, as Monday. And we want to take the rest of this week um, to make sure we're getting all the program details right and that online application that Rebecca is working really hard on, that we have that working. Um, and uh, but anyone can go right now if they're interested in learning more about it and um, getting an email alert when it is live on, hopefully on Monday, um, they can go into this site and actually sign up to receive an alert. Um, so specifically our partnership with Santa Cruz Community Credit Union, we're looking at um, <coughs> 
looking specifically at being able to have the city do some of the front work, um, and then Santa Cruz Community Credit Union would actually manage the funds. And the reason why we uh, really look to have them as a partner is, is they have the experience executing loan documents, dispersing funds, um, and can receive the payments and issue borrower statements. And so that's one of the things that's really in their wheelhouse. It's not in our wheelhouse. And we also didn't want to put this time, this burden on our uh, city finance department um, as well uh, to take on a whole loan program. Um, so what we'll do in our end is we'll manage the application process, we'll review the applications for eligibility, and we'll approve the applications and to balance the loan portfolio. And what we're really looking for as far as balance is um, looking at um, making sure that we're providing loans from both categories, both those that need that short-term bridge financing and those that need some longer-term uh, financing that may not be eligible to apply for some of the SBA funding. We're also looking at other considerations would be loans dispersed across the city in our various commercial areas, um, minority and women-owned businesses as well. So these are some of the categories um, that we'll be looking at. And then we move into um, stage two, which is stabilization. And uh, specifically what we're looking at here is, you know, the first stage is through, you know, roughly through May, and the next one is sort of May to October. We're going to be looking at other opportunities um, to partner um, with across the county, uh, with SBDC, with our chamber, business council, uh, through the WIB, um, through it with other cities and the county on applying for, and, and there's a mechanism that we have with through the Workforce Investment Board and the Community Economic Development Strategy to apply jointly together for Economic Development Administration grants or loans. And so we're looking at opportunities where we may be able to partner with the Community Foundation and create a broader countywide revolving loan program. Um, so this is something that we're looking at for a stage two or what other opportunities out there, what are other things that we can apply for to be able to provide some stability as the economy, as businesses come back online and we want to help stimulate that economy going further. Additionally, there is uh, additional money available through the CARES Act on the community development block grant side. So the initial allocation um, that we received as a grant recipient, um, an existing uh, CDBG grant recipient, um, is roughly, for us, is 282000 But that's about, of the overall $5 billion program, that's only $2 billion of it. The remaining $3 billion of that funding under the CARES Act is still out there um, to be applied for. And so we're looking at the eligibility. Some of it by formula goes to the state and what we could potentially apply through the state. So we're looking at all of those eligibility criteria and try to see what we can bring back to Santa Cruz County to be able to distribute um, locally. So we'll be doing that in stage two. Um, stage three, um, late 2020 and beyond, we're really looking long term, um, again, with the Economic Development Administration on their economic assistance grants, their disaster recovery grants. These are all grants that we've been successful receiving before. Um, we received some multi-million dollar grants uh, right after the recession. We received grants after the earthquake. So we do have a history of being able to apply for these grants and put them and move them out into the community to help stimulate our local <laughs> A local economy. We're additionally looking at um, our, our current Grow Santa Cruz loan program and looking at how we can adapt that program for uh, recovery grants in our community and broaden that relationship that we have with the National Development Council. Um, also looking at leveraging some of the grant funds with creative partnerships um, with foundations and tech companies. And specifically, I'm thinking about, and we've been talking about some of the, like the Apple tech funds, the Google funds, some of the other um, local companies in the broader Bay Area who are reinvesting um, in housing and in other things that will really also help stimulate our local economy. And then finally, investment in capital projects to generate employment. And so that uh, wraps up my brief presentation, and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Bonnie, for that presentation. Are there any members of the council who have um, questions on the presentation? Seeing none, I had two questions, Bonnie. The first was mm -hmm. as it relates to um, those businesses that are waiting on the SBA loans. Do businesses have to be approved for those loans in order to receive the funds? 
clarify, in order to receive our funding? Yes. No. If they have applied for them and they're waiting, and we would also likely be in conversation with some of the local banks on sort of the status of their application, but no, it's not a requirement that they um, have accepted that funding. And that's, in fact, what the second applicant sort of target area is for us are those that we think aren't going to be a good candidate for some of that SBA funding. Got it. Thanks. And then the other question I had <clears throat> with the it's, it's kind of related to what you were just talking about with the businesses that might not um, might not be well served by these lending programs. Um, you mentioned the no payment for six months. Would that also be no interest and no payments or just payments for those first six months? Yeah, no, everything would be deferred for the six months, for the first six months. Great. Those are all the questions I had. Thank you. I did want to add that um, when we submitted the staff report and we continued to work with Santa Cruz Community Credit Union, and so as far as the recommendation, I would also like to add to the motion that you provide the authorization for the city manager to execute an MOU uh, with the Santa Cruz Community Credit Union to help implement the uh, microloan program with us. Thank you. Vice Mayor Myers. Uh, I just would um, I just would like to uh, mention that I'm happy to make a motion. Um, Bonnie, I had a question about um, there's a variable interest rate, it looks like, and are you thinking that for people who need longer term loans, they, there might be some minor interest rates to be able to, to bracket that length of time that they might need the funding, or can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, how we were looking at that is that those that just need that bridge month, that bridge funding for you know three months, that they, that would be zero zero interest, no interest. And if you were looking at a one year, still a relatively short term, that that would be you know one year, eighteen months would be one percent. And however, if you wanted to finance it over three years, um, that potentially could go up to three percent. Okay, thank you, and thanks thanks for your quick work on this. It's really very very exciting. So I hope I hope our community benefits from this. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. It's definitely been teamwork. We're all really excited and and uh, have been all our partners have been really gracious and wanting to make this happen. Before we take action, we we still need to go back to public comment. But um, so I just wanted to make sure it was clear. We still have that one more well, that step. But Vice Mayor Myers, I'll come back to you after we open this up to, for public comment. Um, but um, I'd just like to see if. Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Brown um, had questions on this, so we'll start with okay. Councilmember Matthews. Extravagant phrase. Okay, doesn't seem like there's any further questions. So um, if we can turn it to the public to see if there's any public comment on this item. So there's a series of phone numbers that are presented on your screen. And so if you if you would like to comment on this item, <clears throat> which is the Santa Cruz Resiliency Microloan Program, uh, please call into one of the numbers. You can then enter the meeting ID. And when prompted for participation, please press pound. And if you're interested in commenting on this item, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer will be set for two minutes. Seeing that we have no individuals uh, from the public wanting to comment on this item, we'll bring it back to Council for Action and Deliberation. Um, Vice Mayor Myers. Well, if it's not too pre premature, I'll go ahead and move the item. I think um, it's incredibly important for our 
community to have access to um, to the economic stimulus and the stability um, in particular right now. So um, I'll go ahead and move the item. Let me just switch to my uh, agenda item here. Sorry. Um, so I'll make the motion to authorize the establishment of a Santa Cruz Resilience Microloan Program and resolution to appropriate 500000 from the Economic Development Trust Fund to fund the program and to provide authorization for the city manager. And Bonnie, can you give me that language? Yes, thank you. To provide authorization for the city manager to execute an MOU with Santa Cruz Community Credit Union to help implement the program. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion made by Vice Mayor Myers. I'm happy to second that motion. Or... Councilmember Matthews. Oh, I was hoping to second it, but good for you. Okay. <laughs> and um, again, I can't thank you, Justin, and the department uh, enough, everyone involved in the really, talk about a rapid response team, uh, reaching out and finding out what were the needs. And I think all of us have felt the, the real sense of desperation and creativity and desire to recover from our local businesses. And I think it's so important that we're taking this step to try and provide a quick response that fills gaps. So just Gratitude to everyone who, who made this happen so quickly. Very much appreciated. And uh, I really hope that we can, you know, do the best we can working together moving forward to provide the most help we can for our small businesses and other sectors of the community. Are there any other council members who'd like to speak at this time? Okay, seeing none, we'll turn it to the clerk and we'll do a roll call vote on this item. Council members Watkins? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Byers is absent. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. So the last item on our agenda is oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to speak on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you are interested in addressing the council, uh, pre please call one of the numbers that will be displayed on the screen. Um, once you've called in, please enter the meeting ID number, and when it's prompted for a participation ID, please press pound. If you are interested in addressing the council, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you will have two minutes to speak. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request, we request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comments so that we can accurately capture in the meeting notes. However, it, that is not required. Please, please remember, this is a time for council to hear from the public. It is not a time to engage in dialogue. And when we are able, we will address the questions raised at the end of oral communications. So at this time, if you're interested in the public and you're watching, uh, please um, call one of the numbers that's listed and then enter the meeting ID. So we'll move on to our first um, person here for public comment. Oh, if you could please press star nine if you're interested in speaking during public comment. Hey. Community members, including the council, I emailed the city manager and mayor several days ago looking for specific information and reassurance. Some basic questions. How many of those crammed into unhealthy shelters have been offered the option of motel rooms rather than the dangerous conditions in the vets hall, the armory, the Laurel Street shelter, Page Smith Community House, and the Paul Lee Loft? How many? Will any council member be demanding these figures from the city manager? How many of these have been tested for COVID-19? How many are sick? How many have recovered? Where is the FEMA and governor's funding specifically for those motel rooms where people can be safely 
lodged and not transmit the virus? How much longer will city and county bosses withhold the money? How many motel rooms are currently being occupied? How many kept empty while the virus spreads? The most vulnerable people in our community are those with disabilities and medical conditions over the age of 65 outside. Crowded shelters are unsafe. In San Francisco, this produced outbreaks last week in shelters. And finally, residents began to be relocated. Will we be too late here, too? All residents crammed into group shelters are in danger. We demand house folks shut themselves away in their homes. We fine and threaten jail if they gather in close indoor groups. The blatant brutal truth, homeless people outside are simply discardable, not worth providing access to decent bathrooms, regularly clean porta potties, much less the minimum required safe shelter in place space. Last week, Martine Bernal told us that homeless will at least be left alone to shelter in place. Why am I being told that a homeless man trying to enter his campsite in a park was blocked, threatened with arrest, separated from his survival gear? It is an outrage, a telling truth, that there is nothing on this agenda to protect the entire community by immediate safe shelter for the homeless. This may please those who engineered the silencing and removal of council members Glover and Crone. They couldn't get this mayor to hold an emergency meeting to address this, so now do we simply await the death toll as the virus spreads? Thank you. We have one more member of the public who looks like they've called in for oral communications. Hello? Oh. You are on the line. You're on the line to speak. Oh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Ho hello, can you hear me? Yes, you may want to turn down your uh, TV or um, your computer. I, 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 hello, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Can you hear us? Yeah. yeah. Yes, you can. Okay, I, I will talk. Our bet. Okay, there's quite a delay here between what I hear on the phone and 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 what uh, it, you know you're saying online here. But uh, anyway, I, yeah, there's, this is not going as well as it could, is it? Anyway, our best defense against the virus is a healthy immune system. That's a health directive that never changes. I voice concern over the heavy-handed government response to the COVID emergency. This is in no way a negative comment on the need for social distancing. I am alarmed at the widespread jackboot measures and swift and increasingly apparent make expensive examples of overreaching punitive actions taken by many levels of government. There are fundamental differences between behaviors that cause actual harm and those that are statistically risky that in rare cases cause harm. There is also an issue with assigning a single level of criminal punishment that can apply to any future unlimited number of orders for any emergency, for any act, for any level of safety risk. The fact that there was no bail set for violations of emergency orders was not an oversight. It never came up because the public is normally very cooperative in emergencies. Many of these social distancing orders fall into this category of statistically risky acts, which may or may not cause harm, actual harm difficult to prove or assigned to one individual, and in this present case, considering the few known cases of COVID-19 here, any one low-density violation is extremely unlikely to cause harm. This is absolutely identical in nature to crimes such as speeding, which contribute to 154 annual county vehicle deaths, but speeding is an infraction, not a misdemeanor, with $500 or $1,000 fines and possible jail time. My judgment is assigning misdemeanor status in this case as a panic mode, power grab of authority unwarranted by the facts as we know them, and facts such as mortality rate are still incomplete, and prior panic mode projections are turning out to be false. I am not comforted by the city attorney's claim. Warnings will be given first, as anecdotal reported evidence suggested otherwise. I have no problem with harsh penalties for those who, after warning or infraction citation, refuse to obey direct safety officer directives or interfere and obstruct, but this possible arrest and this meter conviction for a single person or low density groups, for example, walking on a closed beach or park, seems extraordinarily harsh as technical social distance violations are occurring in the thousands every day, like speeding. I urge reconsideration. Sorry, uh, your two minutes is up, so I'd like to thank you for calling in and for your comments, and they will be noted in the record.
Okay, with that, um, that actually concludes our meeting for today. So thank, I would like to thank everyone for tuning in, thank all the staff uh, for their hard work and all the items they brought forward and all uh, my other colleagues who were able to join us today. So with that, uh, we will adjourn our meeting. Thank you. Bye all. <laughs> uh.